since we last convened in November, um, ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday. And it is my pleasure to kick off another meeting of the New York State Climate Action Council. I'm Doreen, uh, Doreen Harris, uh, Acting President and CEO of NYSERDA, joined here by my co-chair, Basil Sagos. Um, and per usual, we've chosen to continue to hold today's meeting uh, via webinar, both as a matter of safety and to enable broader participation across the state. Next slide, please. So that we have another smooth and productive meeting, I will remind the council members of our logistics and procedures. The first is to please remain on mute if you are not speaking so we can limit any background noise. We will also monitor uh, members to ensure they're muted. We would encourage all of you to join on video to the extent possible. You can turn your video on by clicking the camera button on your computer screen. It will be gray if your video is on and red if it is not on. And to ask questions or provide your thoughts, we will ask that you use the raise your hand feature during uh, using the hand icon on your screen. This will indicate to Basil or me that you would like to speak. And to get to the hand raise icon, you need to click on the panelist particip participant button, which is marked off in a red box between the bot button with the three dots and the button with the camera on the third visual on this slide. And when we call on you, you can unmute yourself um, and uh, certainly remute yourself when you're done speaking. We do anticipate roll call votes during today's meeting, so we hope to work through the logistics of that process smoothly, including, we hope, a slightly more streamlined way to do so. So please stay tuned on that. And finally, I will note um, that Jake Erickson is serving as the point of contact for any technical issues you may have during this webinar. Um, council members should direct any questions um, to him directly using his email address shown here on the screen. He will be on standby throughout the meeting. So let's begin by calling the roll um, to see which members of the council are in attendance today. I'll ask Nyserta's Valerie Milanovic to call the roll in alphabetical order with members of the council saying here as your name is called. If you are a designee for the head of a state agency, please state your name and note the commissioner you are representing. Uh, Val? Val, you may be on mute. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Sorry for all those technical difficulties. Thanks, Doreen. Good afternoon, good afternoon, council members and designees. Um, I'll call your name for uh, participation in today's Climate Action Council meeting. We do have a, a number of uh, designees that we were alerted about ahead of time. And uh, right now I acknowledge the participation of co-chair Doreen Harris. Co-chair Sago? I'm here, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Commissioner Ball? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Donna Di Carola? Here. Great. Commissioner Dominguez? Hello, hello. Hello. Gavin Donahue? Good afternoon. Thank you. Welcome. Dennis Elsenbeck? Here. Great. CEO Falcone? Here. Commissioner Gerster? Commissioner was having technical difficulties earlier, Val. So, yeah, we'll, um, we'll circle back. Rose Harvey? Here. Here. Great. Thanks, Rose. Bob Howard? I'm here. Thank you. Great. Peter Iwanowicz? I'm here. Thank you. Great. On behalf of Chancellor Malatra, Kathy Allen. We'll circle back. CEO Quinones. Present. Great. Commissioner Reardon. Here. Ann Reynolds. I know she was there earlier. I'm here. Hello. Hi, Ann. Great. Thanks. 
Chair Rhodes. I'll circle back. On behalf of Secretary Rosado, Keisha Santiago Martinez. Good afternoon, I'm here. Great. Raya Salter. Hi, John Rhodes is here. I'm sorry. I was. Oh, that's extra okay. Muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a day. <laughs> Raya Salter. Present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Paul Shepton. I am here. Good afternoon. Great. On behalf of Commissioner Visnauskas, Melina Strato. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. You did, thank you. You're welcome. And on behalf of Commissioner Zucker, Henry Slita. I'm here, thank you. Great. And I see Commissioner Gertler, I did a minute ago, so just one more. One more check there. Hold on. Oh, great. You Thank you. Can you hear me now? Great. I'm present. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Right. I can. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. And one more check on Kathy Allen on behalf of Chancellor Malatro. Well, hopefully we'll we'll catch up with her in a bit. But given that, council co-chairs, I do note the presence of a quorum for today's climate action council meeting. Great, thank you, Val. And again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, when we look at our agenda for today, you will see that it begins as typical with consideration of the minutes of our last meeting on November 24th. Um, Basil and I will share a few reflections as council co-chairs. And then during our last meeting, we voted on the members of our waste advisory panel. Uh, we today will hear more about their work plan. We will also consider a few more members for the panel, including from our labor community. And then um, we, will, we will hear from the chairs um, from the panels, um, the Climate Action Council's transportation, power generation, energy intensive and trade exposed industries advisory panels, and the Just Transition Working Group with their, their updates as requested. Um, the chairs will speak to group discussions to date, including strategies under discussion now. And then we will share an update on the work of the Climate Justice Working Group. So a full agenda, and we will wrap it up with next steps. Next slide, please. Before we get underway with the formal meeting um, agenda, I did want to provide two quick updates for the group. Um, at our last meeting, we started a discussion about bioenergy, and we had what I viewed, and I know my co-chair viewed as a good exchange of thoughts. Our intent with the November discussion was to identify explicitly where the CLCPA statute speaks on the issue of bioenergy. And our intent thereafter was to follow up with a reminder on where the pathways analysis had identified some opportunity spaces for bioenergy in the various sectors. We had wanted to provide this discussion to help provide some bounds and direction for the advisory panels as they are tasked to consider this resource among the strategies they recommend uh, to meet the admissions reduction contributions from their individual sectors and to advance the overall state goals. Upon reflection, and as we were thinking about how to structure the necessary continuation of this discussion, we have determined that we are perhaps addressing this issue too much in the abstract, um, which may not lead to a clear discussion among the council members at this point regarding the opportunities or concerns which um, may exist with this resource. So instead, um, what we are going to put in place as a next step is to ask explicitly that the advisory panels continue their, to advance their work, both with respect to prospective sources and uses of these resources, and to continue to reference the pathways analysis and other pertinent materials in their overall assessment um, and recommendations around overall sector emissions reduction strategies. So we would look to those recommendations to advance to us as the panel finds appropriate 
with respect to the scale and application of any bioenergy opportunity, as well as other technology opportunities. And specifically, how that scale and application would fit within the overall sector reductions that are also being advanced. So with those recommendations, we as a council can then revisit this discussion, then grounded in this quantification provided by the panels and what our panel recommendations may identify as a worthy approach. And then we as a council um, can determine how to address these recommendations. So therefore, you know, with this direction directly to the panels, um, we will expect to take this topic up again as a Climate Action Council in the coming months um, upon receipt of those panel recommendations. So that is the, the path forward around bioenergy and, and wanted to make sure that was explicitly clear at the outset of today's meeting. The second um, general update and another bit of uh, housekeeping and for your awareness, um, the council members themselves will recall that a few meetings ago, we discussed how we would be better served by having direct access to utility expertise as both the advisory panels develop their recommendations and as we, as the council, will consider those recommendations in the development of the scoping plan. And to provide that expert assistance, um, we have now formed a utility consultation group. The group will have representatives from each of the large utilities in the state, National Grid, the Avon Grid Utilities, Central Hudson, and Con Edison. And I would also invite um, Tom at LIPA and Gil from NIPA to contribute to these efforts as well. We see this group as serving as a resource to the panels at large to help inform them of system considerations to account for in their strategies and recommendation development. So we see this group as also becoming very helpful as it seems to be the case with cross panel issues, such as buildings and transportation electrification strategies. And we hope this group will provide constructive input as the panels identify issues to examine and help to support consistency across the panel recommendations that we ultimately receive. And through the scoping panel process, I welcome thoughts for where this utility information would help to promote our state investment and objectives. So I want to explicitly thank council member Gavin Donahue for the thought and efforts with organizing and leading this new group for us. And I would also like to thank council member Donna DeCarolis for agreeing to help support this group as well. And I know that Chair Rhodes is already thinking generally of how this resource will contribute to the power generation advisory panel and would like to ask um, Chair Rhodes if he has thoughts to share as well. Um, John? Sorry, my uh, thoughts are the ones that yeah. you've already expressed on behalf of all of us. Um, it's it's a pro it's great. Um, I expect this uh, to be helpful. Um, I know um, I know the, the the folks at the utilities, um, and you know the, the the assistance they're capable of. I know that uh, Donna and um, Gavin will be terrific shepherds of this work. Um, I know my the, the panel that I happen to be chair of, the PowerGen panel will be very happy for this this engagement, um, and I expect um, ours is not the only panel, uh, but um, I think it's a great augmentation um, of our uh, of our expertise. So uh, thanks to all for orchestrating this. Thank you, John. Um, I appreciate that. And I also want to ask um, Gavin or, or Donna directly if they have any additional thoughts to share. Gavin, Donna? So I'll start, I'll just say thank you. Looking forward to assisting um, and, and I think um, I think it'll be very, very helpful to the work of the Climate Action Council. So thank you. Gavin, I'll turn it to you. Oh, Donna, thanks. I um, I just want to thank uh, Basil and, and Doreen for 
acknowledging and John Rhodes too, uh, the push that I've been making about utility involvement at the working group level. This is a big, big step. Um, I appreciate Donna stepping up and, and helping me as a, as a gas utility. Uh, I hope to bring something productive back to the group uh, to move the ball forward and uh, looking forward to, to it. So kudos to you guys to recognizing the important role the utilities can play in this process. Thanks. Well, thank you both and, uh, and, uh, Let's get to work. Um, we'll look forward to um, obviously the active engagement and also the report that you may provide um, to the council as as your work progresses. So, so um, with that, um, that would conclude um, the general updates that I had wanted to provide to make sure that we start this meeting um, with with a so solid foundation as to uh, where we where we exist in both respects. So with that, um, I would like to move to the consideration of our November uh, minutes um, of the last meeting. Um, the council members received the draft minutes um, with their meeting materials. Um, I would like to ask if there's any discussion on the minutes themselves before we move to approve them. All right, hearing none, um, we can move to approve the minutes. Um, we are going to change course a bit here from our usual protocol, so stay tuned. Um, I will instead ask for a motion to approve the minutes, please. Um, so if you, if someone could please approve them or make the motion, I'd appreciate it. Motion. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone disapprove of the minutes? If so, um, please signify um, by speaking up uh, directly here, unmuting yourself as such. Great, thank you. So since no opposition was expressed, the minutes are adopted and will be posted to the Climate Action Council's website. Um, thank you all. And I will now um, begin with our co-chair uh, reflections. Next slide, please. So even in the few weeks since we last met, New York has continued to make great strides under Governor Cuomo's leadership. Next slide, please. New York um, maintained its national leadership in sustainable finance this month, um, leveraging the power of investment strategy and climate risk disclosure to signal to investors that the state's economy is a, a strong market for investments in clean energy. So following through on Governor Cuomo's call to adopt a serious and responsible plan to decarbonize its retirement assets, Comptroller DiNapoli announced the commitment of getting New York Common, New York Common Fund's portfolio of on, over 220 billion in assets to net zero emissions by 2040 and divesting from fossil fuel companies. So in doing so, New York becomes the first US, U.S. state and the largest pension fund in the nation to remove oil and gas stocks from its financial portfolio. And the state pension fund will also sell its shares in other companies that still contribute to climate change by 2040. So the work between the governor and the comptroller, complemented by an advisory panel of experts, has provided a feasible and actionable decarbonization roadmap to help guide the fund toward new clean energy and other responsible investment opportunities. So this investment and this action will not only help us combat climate change, but it will protect the hard-earned retirement assets for more than 1 million current and future New Yorkers as we also seek to recover from the COVID pandemic. So a major announcement that we certainly wanted to start with. Uh, next slide, please. And two other recent announcements. Um, first, the deep decarbonization um, workshop, as you can see here, over 300 attendees participated in a four-hour webinar sponsored by Night Sort of Innovation Team in partnership with DEC. It was an educational workshop on innovative technologies that could support New York's movement toward a carbon neutral economy. And in doing so, I know I learned a lot in listening to the webinar. Um, 
and I know um, we will be making the recording available for others as well. Looking at technologies such as carbon capture, um, long duration energy storage, hydrogen and HS HFC replacements. Really looking at the technical potential for pathways to get to net zero um, and to allow us all to begin with a common understanding of the technical considerations associated with each. But equally important, the event included an environmental justice leaders roundtable to learn of their perspective on what matters to communities and how the state should evaluate decarbonization solutions, such as those discussed during the roundtable. So this is just a start, but for those who missed it, I would strongly recommend it's worth your time to really um, immerse yourself in this future opportunity space. I will also note um, of an important request for proposal issued by NYSERDA, um, referenced by Governor Cuomo in his 2020 State of the State, in which NYSERDA was directed to make $5 million in funding available to support power plant communities in evaluating the power plant site and potential reuse opportunities. This is a topic we've been working on a lot in the Just Transition Working Group, and I know Commissioner Reardon will be speaking about it later. But we at NYSERDA have been laying the groundwork for that critical support to take shape. And this information we gathered in doing so um, will qualify consultants and other firms to support reuse planning studies at these sites. So um, this concept was modeled after a multitude of research, including our own work in New York on the Indian Point Closure Task Force Site Reuse Report, which helped us um, guide our work um, in, in this broader and uh, future looking initiative. So we want everyone to be aware that this RFP is open for consultants to respond by January 13th. And of course, um, we look forward to making those funds available to host communities through a future program opportunity notice. So good news um, from NYSERDA. And if we turn to the next slide, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Basil Sagos, to talk about a few updates from DEC. Okay, thanks, Doreen. Hi, everybody. Yep. Hope you all doing well. Just a few quick announcements from my side. Um, yesterday, many of you uh, saw a, a pretty cool announcement that we made with NYSERDA uh, to use our drone technology to begin uh, identifying and ultimately plugging some of these orphaned oil and gas wells that we have across New York State. We've done it the hard way up to this point, uh, shoe leather and, um, and spelunking to some degree, um, and have plugged uh, upwards of uh, 340 different wells around the state. We believe that there may be uh, several thousand of them, and we want a way to to um, identify these wells quickly and be able to deploy our resources effectively. So there's where drones come in, um, obviously using innovation and uh, some of the great teams between DEC and ICERTA who can coordinate on um, on applying all the new and available and exciting technology that we have here in, in uh, New York State. DEC was an early adopter in the drone program. We actually have the state's biggest drone fleet and lots of experience within uh, within our our offices. And um, I, I think this is gonna be a real game changer for us uh, in uh, the parts of the state that have some of these wells. Um, so that's that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, back on December 1st, I'm sure you saw the announcement where the Reggie States, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative States, came together uh, to announce the, the cap has been reduced by 30% regional cap that's 65 percent total below 1990 levels so very uh very significant and and we've seen some great gains within the power sector uh because of reggie um specific to new york state which is uh really important for us was the inclusion of peaking units the smaller peaking units that are typically in uh, urban environmental justice neighborhoods uh, where you have some of the worst air pollution problems uh we brought those units into the into the program and uh expect that to be an effective tool for us to, to close those uh, those emissions down. Um, and also uh, partnering with Mesurda on how those dollars are then invested uh, out of Reggie, aligning it better with the uh, spirit and letter of the CLCPA in terms of uh, investment of proceeds. So another exciting uh, month, uh, as you heard from Doreen and, and from, uh, from DEC as well. Uh, we're not the only ones at it. Next slide, please. Um, NIPA, always on the cutting edge. Uh, I want to turn it over to my good buddy, 
Gil Quinones to describe all the great work that they're doing. Gil. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm excited to share the news that our Board of Trustees approve our new strategic plan, which we call Vision 2030. Uh, in addition, they approved our diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, as well as our budget for next year and our four-year financial plan uh, for the Power Authority. Our strategic plan focuses on five areas. The first one is preserving and enhancing the value of our hydropower assets to serve as the base of our state's uh, renewable energy and to help uh, meet the 70 by 30 goal in a cost-effective way for all New Yorkers. Uh, we also will look to uh, build priority transmission projects to integrate renewables, uh, land-based and offshore wind renewables to our system. Uh, the third strategic initiative is we are looking to transition our natural gas power plant fleet in New York City and Long Island to low or no carbon emission technologies and resources by 2035. If you recall in our last uh, Climate Action Council, uh, I uh, informed you about our partnership with the Environmental Justice Coalition here in New York City called PEAK. And so we will work very closely with them in that journey. The third is to help our customers prioritize, help our customers decarbonize their operations and to supply them with carbon free electricity by 2035. And last but not the least is to reimagine the canals, uh, which it was announced by our a governor earlier this year, and uh, we are so excited in implementing the the, the uh, ideas and the initiatives to make our canals be a center for resiliency, uh, economic development, and environmental restoration. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Back to you, Gil. Thank Gil, you. Thank you. And, um, Gil's doing great work across the board. If you haven't had the chance to dig into the reimagining the canals uh, program that that Gil and his great team came up with, uh, please do. It's it's really fascinating to see what uh, what we might be able to do with our canals in the future, and, and it's even happening right now. I know you've been doing pioneering work on ice jams, um, and the weather doesn't start to uh, improve, we'll be dealing with ice jams um, all winter. Um, so thank you, Gil. Uh, next, over to uh, Lipa where Tom Falcone will describe some of the great stuff that uh, he's doing down in Long Island with his team. Tom? Great. Thank you, Chair Segos. I'll be very brief, but uh, a quick update for the committee on offshore wind, obviously a big component of the state's transition to a zero carbon electric grid. Uh, we continue to see advancement of the transmission cable uh, permitting process for New York's first offshore wind uh, project. And also recently completed a study of the transmission reinforcements required to get to 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind and completed that study jointly with Con Ed and submitted it uh, to the Public Service Commission and also NYSERDA is doing an evaluation of it. Uh, in terms of other small things going on, announced the retirement of 68 megawatts of peaking units here on Long Island. Uh, one will decommission at the end of 2020, the other one in the first quarter of 2021. And we're also, we've also announced the retirement of 400 to 600 megawatts of other power plants and we'll be announcing the selection of which ones in the first quarter of next year. Uh, additionally, brought a 23 megawatt solar project online and launched something that's uh, very exciting to us. Uh, we call it solar, uh, solar communities, and we basically went out and did a feed-in tariff, bought solar in bulk, and we'll now be streaming those benefits to our low and moderate income customers. So the first, uh, first feed-in tariff, the first competitive solicitation came in, the bids looked great, and so that's often to the races. So thank you all uh, on the committee. Great, Tom, thank you. Um, okay, next up, <clears throat> back to DEC, uh, Martin Brand, if you could give us an update on the waste panel, please. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Brand, Deputy Commissioner for Remediation and Materials Management at DEC. Um, I'm going to give you a little a little update on the progress of the of the waste panel, uh, what we've been doing 
in the couple of weeks since we were uh, uh, set up here at the last CAC meeting on 1124. I'll run through the um, the work plan. As you know, the work plan is a pretty basic document. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of granularity in it, uh, but it attempts to capture some of the larger buckets and the larger categories that we want to focus on moving forward as we develop uh, recommendations and strategies uh, to reduce uh, methane emissions, greenhouse gas emissions around the state. Um, so the panel was established on 1124, as you all know. Uh, we've met twice since then. Uh, I want to thank the panel, um, several of whom are listening right now uh, on the attendee list uh, for getting together so quickly. Uh, it's a good group, very active, a lot of good ideas, and uh, they're they're ready to go. We we spent a lot of time already talking about very specific strategies and recommendations <clears throat> moving forward. Um, we we focused on the work plan at our last meeting and established some of the goals. I'll go over in a minute. Um, We've also established a couple of sub panel work groups, like many of the other panels have in order to focus our work and also to get, you know, additional discussions going in the, in the short time frame that we have in order to meet the, uh, the ambitious schedules uh, uh, for the panel work. And we, of course, will be working with the climate justice working group here coming up uh, with uh, and establishing a liaison between our panel and that group, as well as having uh, collaborative meetings and discussions with the other panels. And as you'll see, it, just like all the other panels, there are a number of cross-cutting issues that we have to discuss uh, with them. Um, all the goals I'm gonna present now um, are based on, on the goal of reducing methane emissions primarily. Um, certainly there's a number of ancillary benefits for some of these programs I'm gonna discuss. Uh, but again, just just so you're clear that just like all the other panels, our goal is to reduce methane emissions to the maximum amount possible. There are a number of cross-cutting issues, as I discussed, as I discussed, which will re require collaboration. And again, just for the work plan purposes, you all saw the work plans from the other panels a few months ago. Now, these are kind of broad-based categories that that will help define our work moving forward. So this, I think you'll see as we go through um, that. Um, even though they're grouped grouped as separate items, there's a lot of crossover between all of these all of these topics. Um, there's some general themes there. You know, one is waste avoidance. You know, don't create the waste in the first place. So essentially, a true materials management ethic that carries through here. And certainly, we're going to focus on disposal avoidance, landfill avoidance, and those type of things. We're going to focus on capture of resources and emissions from facilities, uh, either for energy use, for other use. And of course, we're going to continue to discuss and, and, and work towards reducing the impact of some of these waste activities on, on the host communities uh, around the state. So in this first slide, slide here, and these are not in any particular order, nor are they in uh, an order of where we think the maximum emissions are. These are just areas that we're going to work forward uh, in the near future. So. Uh, first one there, maximize efficient recovery and local scale processing of recyclable materials. Um, this is something we've discussed uh, a little bit in depth already. Uh, this, this has a dual function of reducing emissions from from some of the uh, truck and rail transportation impacts, but it's, uh, also it's a focus back away from large scale massive facilities that have that have uh, impacts uh, on on many of our communities around the state. And it'll also in increase our organics collection, create some local community-based uh, buy-in to, to uh, solid waste management and, and provide some economic stimulus. So this is something we're gonna be uh, looking at in, in depth, uh, moving forward and working with the other panels that you see there. Probably the biggest bucket here for, for our panel is certainly landfills and waste management facilities, particularly those that handle methane producing wastes. So those are the organic, organic waste, the biosolids, food waste, paper, those type of things, which are land filled in, in great quantities here in New York. So we're gonna look at a variety of programs that will, first of all, increase our waste reduction, reuse and recycling pro programs around the state, look at separation programs, diversion programs in general, uh, to keep organic waste and those methane waste out of the landfills. At the same time, we're going to take a, a good look at the facilities themselves to operate, uh, optimize the operations and process controls to reduce leaks uh, and, and methane leaks uh, from those facilities. 
And uh, we've already had some discussion with the Ag and Forestry uh, uh, staff working group on this, and this is going to be an area of significant crossover uh, as we work with some of the other panels on, on the handling of organic waste around the state. So the large general theme for the last, the last bullet on this page is to, again, increase waste diversion, reduce disposal. This is sort of the hierarchy of waste disposal in New York State. It's been a fundamental part of our policies and strategies for the last oh, 20 years or so, and is really codified in our solid waste management plan. But essentially, we're going to take a hard look at uh, all our plans and programs uh, in place for waste reduction, reuse, and recycling. Uh, continue to, to come up with strategies, incentive programs, uh, revenue streams, uh, regulatory schemes that will just continue to increase uh, any way we can to avoid waste in the in the first place, and then certainly eventually uh, keep it out of the landfills where uh, it generates uh, methane emissions. Next slide, please. So. Uh, Carrying forward that theme, um, we looked at, we're going to look at um, things like extended producer responsibility programs and product stewardship programs. This is something that we've been talking about for many, many years. Uh, we have we have some of these programs in place, and we want to really uh, dive a little bit deeper in here. This is this is where, again, the emphasis is on reducing methane emissions. But if we can keep these materials out of landfills, out of the disposal stream increase recycling, you know, divert the metals, divert the plastics away from the, from the entire solid waste management infrastructure and put that back into the manufacturers. Um, it has definitely um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, potential here, uh, as well as other ancillary benefits to, to keep making progress in, in our great recycling programs around the state. So we're gonna spend some time working on this. We're gonna take a look at water resource recovery plants or wastewater treatment plants. Um, and really transform this idea of, of those being waste plants um, and transform that idea into them being resource recovery facilities. There's, there's a number of things that we can capture that's in wastewater, whether it's renewable bioproducts, whether it's, it's methane gas, biogas emitted by the facilities, as well as other products, including biosolids uh, that could potentially be feedstocks for energy development. And, and the like. So we're going to look at anaerobic digestion opportunities, energy efficiencies, um, co-location, co-generation uh, potential, and obviously as well uh, look at those facilities for just some of the nuts and bolts operations to reduce methane and other emission leaks here. And this is again another area where there's going to be significant cross-cutting collaboration between the other panels. Um, this next one, align and expand incentives. You know, we're looking at a number of ways uh, that we can divert wastes from landfills, but there's opportunities there for things like energy recovery, um, and we're gonna we're gonna take a look at those programs. Uh, we want to really look at the revenue streams and the cost the cost analysis here, and provide incentives and all that. So this this bullet really just reflects uh, an effort that we have to look at. Uh, incentives across the state, across programs, across sectors, and work with our other other panels to really align these incentives to maximize things like creation of anaerobic digestion, landfill diversion, waste combustors, and those type of things. And then finally, you know, the panels is also cognizant that as we work towards all these waste reduction programs and waste emission uh, programs, that we really have to serve the communities in New York State. They have to have local and available waste management infrastructure in place uh, in order to accomplish these good goals. So we really want to focus on, on making sure that uh, the people in the state still have access to good solid waste management infrastructure that makes sense, that they can afford, and also works, works towards accomplishing these goals of reducing emissions. Okay, next slide, please. So here's just the, the schedule moving forward. As you see there, we, we stood the panel up in November. We've been working on work plan and draft panel recommendations, and we'll continue to meet uh, moving forward. Um, January, February, we expect to have some public facing meetings to generate more information from stakeholders. And then the uh, the rest of the timeline there is in line with the other uh, 
uh, the panels and the recommendation schedule as well. And we'll be uh, continuing uh, our work. Uh, we'll be reaching out to uh, experts around the state to come in and provide information to the panel to help us in our deliberations. Um, we're already engaging a number of experts to come in and present to the different panels. We'll hold at least one public session in January 2020 uh, or 2021, that should be, um, to, to again, gather as much information as we can from the public uh, as we work towards our recommendations. So that's very quickly where we are in the waste panel. Um, as uh, we noted in the beginning of the meeting, uh, at the last CAC meeting on 1124, we established a panel. We did set aside two placeholders for uh, subject matter experts and a labor rep. And at this time, we'd like to, to present some candidates. Um, I can introduce them briefly. Commissioner, turn it back to you for the for the discussion and any nominations, if that works for you. Sure. Thank you, Martin. So you can see the highlighted um, names there on the chart. Uh, Bernadette Kelly, international representative from the Teamsters, 27-year uh, veteran of the labor movement, is very engaged, has been very engaged in solid waste issues around the state and particularly in the, in the downstate area, is uh, our nomination for a labor representative. And then George Bevington, who's a senior project manager for Barton uh, Logidus, um, a consulting firm in the Capital District area, 39 year veteran of the wastewater uh, field and other uh, aspects of environmental engineering, and also brings a lot of expertise on the anaerobic digestion side. So George would provide some uh, necessary technical expertise to the panel moving forward. So those are the two names and uh, categories that we're presenting today. Back to you, Commissioner. Okay, I see that Raya has her hand raised. Just wanna uh, flag that as the discussion now kicks off. Thank you so much. I just wanted to, um, my presentation, I wanted to flag that I would highly encourage that on the issue of meeting community needs that you um, do you consider liaising with another panel at, at minimum, I'd say, land use and local government? Um, sure thing. I think I, I may not have called it out specifically, but it, uh, certainly in the, uh, the last bullet on the one slide talking about making sure that local communities have access to, to, to common sense, solid waste management planning, land use, local government would be a, an obvious collaboration point. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Raya. Any other questions on this? Don't see any. Okay. Great. Well, I, I, Martin, I thank you and really the entire uh, team for playing catch up on that one. Uh, the panel's been working hard on it, I know. Um, let me kick it over to Valerie for the uh, for the for the vote. If there are no is there if there's no further conversation, um, Valerie, would you take it away? Sure, providing you can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, when I call your name, please acknowledge your vote on the resolution approving additional members to the Waste Advisory Panel as presented today. Co-Chair Sago? Aye. Co-Chair Harris? Aye. Commissioner Ball? Aye. Donna DeCarola? Aye. Commissioner Dominguez? Aye. Gavin Donahue? Aye. Dennis Elsenbeck? Yes. Dennis? Yes. Okay. Uh, CEO Falcone? Aye. Commissioner Gertler? Aye. Rose Harvey? Aye. Bob Howard? Aye. Peter Ivanowitz? Aye. CEO Quinones? Aye. Commissioner Reardon? Aye. Ann Reynolds? Aye. Chair Rose?
Aye. Did I get through? On behalf of Secretary Rosado, Keisha Santiago Martinez. Aye. Raya Salter. Aye. Paul Shepton. Aye. On behalf of Commissioner Viznauskas, Melina Strato. Aye. And on behalf of Commissioner Zucker, uh, Henry Sleetoff or Gary Ginsburg. This is Henry Sleetoff. Aye. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. With that, the resolution is adopted. Great. Thank you, Valerie. Um, before we proceed, um, I just want to make a quick announcement. Um, we, uh, we have actually met our first regulatory milestone under the CLCPA. Just a few moments ago, a uh, press release went out detailing uh, the uh, filing of the emissions limit regulation. Uh, we filed that with the Department of State. Um, this obviously is, as you all know, uh, critical toward our goal of reducing emissions 40% by 2030 and then 85% by 2050, and that's from a 1990 baseline. Um, and that also includes associated impacts of uh, imported electricity and fossil fuels. Um, any questions on that? Encourage you to, all to read the uh, regulatory package as it's uh, put forth and certainly our, our press releases has been made available now. Great news. I, uh, it will be tremendously useful in informing the scoping plan as well. So good timing. Great. Glad to hear it. Thanks for your work on that too. Okay, fantastic. So let's go to the next segment. Actually, before we do that, um, I was hoping I could weigh in if possible as Peter Armando wants. Sure, go ahead, Peter. So, um, Doreen, you started off the meeting and it caught me a little bit off guard because I thought we we're going to jump into the approval of the minutes, but you had mentioned something related to biofuels and then the utility working group. And I just wanted to go back to those topics uh, for a minute before we jump in the presentation. Um, first thing is, um, there was a great panel for the uh, land use and local government sector roundtable with local government leaders. It'd be great to see more diverse sort of representation of that panel um, in terms of um, uh, uh, BIPOC communities, Black and Indigenous people of color sort of led um, uh, local government leaders. It seemed a little bit short in that regard. Um, but I'm curious if there's going to be an intention to convene that panel the same way that a utility panel would be convene to help guide our process. It's nice to have it sort of consultation within the panel itself, but it, it really, I, I've made this point before, but I think it's um, it's really incumbent upon us to, to engage local governments in a more um, intersectional and more sustained conversation. So much of what is going to happen in New York State as we implement the goals of this law will happen with local government partners that I fear that without a more sustained representation on that panel in a cross sector discussion group, um, we could be running into some, you know, difficulties fairly quickly with implementation of this law. Um, local governments are approving projects right now that dig the hole deeper on climate, whether it's a local gas station or a housing development that's dependent upon fossil fuels. And these are decisions that lock us into fossil fuels beyond beyond the time frame of the CLCPA. And I just think it's really important um, that we find that space in that role as we've done with uh, the extractive side of the industry with the utilities working group that we formed. Um, so I continue to, to, to find a role for that and then try to figure that piece of it out. I don't think a round table is enough. Um, the second thing is on, on biofuels. I, I don't know if I, I object to sort of the characterization about how it's going forward, but I certainly have concerns that probably lead me to object. But back when the Pathways re report was initially rolled out to us this summer, um, you know, as the minutes reflect, I raised the question about the extent that that Pathways report contemplated co-pollutants in consideration with biofuels. And the, the comment back to us at that time was it didn't. And I thought that was a significant shortcoming as it relates to a heavy endorsement of biofuels as a pathway forward. Um, and I know we get into a greater detail, but um, the whole concept of a life cycle analysis in the minutes we approved today, you know, have a little bit of discussion on page 12. And, and it seems like 
if we're now suggesting that the panels continue to deliberate on this concept of biofuels and, and the role it might play, I don't think we provided enough guidance to them as the severe constraints to the role that biofuels will play in, in meeting the CLP, CPA. This defined categories where they're excluded and, and where they would participate. And I wonder if it all just sort of flows back to this concept of people in shorthand call our climate law is is achieving net zero emissions. And I think that's a misnomer and a marketing phrase that has then led people to believe that there's this trading that's going to go on in, in categories. And, you know, I really think that at the decarbonization panel, Saul Griffith laid it out quite succinctly. And then the first question was about biodiesel or heavy duty diesel. And he just said, these incremental steps aren't the right pathway. You need to go into electrification. So my objection and concern is, is that we're directing the panels to keep devising plans that some of which are and you know dependent upon biofuels as a strategy in both short and long term and i think that's a big mistake and i don't think the law allows in many categories and i think we've seen it I'll, I'll point to an example the transportation panel looking at the whole concept of low carbon fuel standards which is can be highly dependent upon biofuels uh displacing some of the carbon of fossil fuels and i think that's a clear tangible example where not looking at co-pollutants, not understanding the relationship between um, mobile sources and whether or not you could have offsets even qualify for a mobile source offset. I mean, I think a lot of these things, it's to, you know, it's incumbent upon us as a council to have deeper deliberations of that before we just blind, not blindly, but just sort of casually, I would say, tell the panels to continue to noodle on the role biofuels can play when it's at the end of the day, the statute has a very limited um, role for them to play. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, I appreciate the the input. Um, on your first point, um, I, I'd want to say clearly that I view this utility um, group quite differently um, with respect to the the use um, of the panel or of the group um, in this process. You know, I think of the utility group as as very much a technical resource, Peter. Um, in the sense that we're very much looking at their in-depth expertise on technical issues that may inform the panels themselves and our and their ultimate uh, recommendations. So I, I see it quite differently in that respect. However, I see some similarities um, with the, I would say, a paramount uh, importance to ultimately develop information that is useful to us as a council. So if there is a way um, that you know, we would we would agree on, and, and I'm happy to work in the coming few weeks to figure out what that would be to, to create a similar sort of vehicle to provide information to the council from the perspective of local governments. I'm, I'm happy to do so, but the, the, the main reason for forming this group was, was indeed as a technical resource, and for those reasons, um, I do see them differently. Um, on the on the you know the characterization on bioenergy, I want you to know that it is nothing. There is nothing casual about what we are launching here, um, in the sense that we are truly just looking to bring the expertise to bear with the people that have the expertise. Um, the question of co pollutants is one very much that we would expect, for instance, the Ag and Forestry Panel to take up and to consider. Um, we know um, that as recommendations are advanced, it's an important um, issue to, to bring up as we think about the extent to which this is a resource to bring to bear on our goals. Um, I do think that it's just a broader set of issues that ultimately we're going to have to um, grapple with with this topic. Um, and, and collectively, that's the reason that these panels are the best places to do so. You know, the transportation panel, for instance, is going to have a lot more on its plate um, than than this sole question. They need to look at it holistically, as I know we'll be hearing about in just a minute. So I, I appreciate your input and I want you to be assured that, you know, I actually do look at this um, similarly. It's just through a different uh, pathway. Yeah, so thank you, Doreen. I appreciate that. I'm just wondering how this is all communicated back to the panels then. Is there some type of directive that you have sent off to the panel to give them the appropriate guardrails and understanding that like co-pollutants, they're going to have to look hard at these things? Yes, yes. And in fact, um, it's a great day to, to actually bring this to, to practice. Um, you obviously have the panel chairs 
here today in large parts, um, and they're, you know, I'm sure they're equipped to speak to the issue, but understanding um, they're, they are well aware of this as a need, I, I think is, is the best way to characterize it and, and the expertise we're anticipating from them. Okay. Yeah, I just don't know. We would translate a memo from the council back to them, so we just have some written record of it, or it's just relying on the minutes discussion here to to reflect that for everybody, and they're aware of them. Um, and just let me just say, I, I I'm happy to hear. I'm not put words in your mouth. It sounds like you endorse the the need for a deeper, more technical discussion with local governments. I really, you know, I've been a firm believer in that for a while, and I hope you and I can work together to figure that pathway out. It's just critically important. The one thing I'll just um, add to the conversation um, is that in addition to the roundtable itself, there have been considerable, you know, smaller group conversations with the, the members. There were, I believe it was 20 um, who were on the line. We selected two from each region. Um, and uh, in addition to what was discussed there, uh, there were some additional points that we've been raising with the other panel chairs. So those conversations have not gotten lost. So I just want to sort of reassure you that um, all of their conversations and their knowledge base and their experience is being passed along uh, for inclusion in other panel work. Thank you, Peter. Um, I appreciate your input and I'm happy to turn it back to my co-chair. Um, it looks like we're ready to take up just this topic, which is what the advisory panels are, are working toward. Great, Doreen, thank you. So uh, we'll do four panels. Transportation, uh, Marie Therese Dominguez, Power Gen, John Rhodes, Energy Intensive Trade Exposed Industries, Eric Gertler, and Just Transition Working Group, Roberta Reardon and Doreen. Um, so, as is, I guess, my assigned job permanently, I'm the timekeeper on these things. 20 minutes each, please. Um, I'm looking at you, Mr. Rhodes. Um, I'm just joking. I know you're going to be quick with this. Um, but let's kick it off with a great discussion about transportation. All right. Dominguez. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, quick context setting here, um, just to give you an update on the transportation advisory panels work. We've conducted uh, outreach uh, to help inform our discussion here. Um, it includes coordination with the other CL panels, including land use and local government, as well as the work groups, including the work just transition work group. Um, we've held a uh, public outreach uh, meeting, a public meeting that we held in November. We had great participation and uh, and our expert roundtables that we just held two of which we just held in December. So our discussion and our uh, consideration areas here are all informed uh, by uh, the ever advancing discussions that we continue to have with folks. So, um, a couple of things, the transportation advisory panel uh, has really focused primarily on developing policies and strategies uh, and including financing for consideration across the board. And that's what I'm going to review with you all today. Uh, so, with that in mind, uh, there are several policy areas that the uh, transportation advisory panel has focused our efforts on specifically the 1st, which is teed up here is electrification. Um, obviously, increased electrification has emerged as a primary strategy to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the transportation sector. Uh, strategic investments in electrification will not only position New York as a global leader in the removal of harmful pollutants from the environment, but it will also serve uh, to create a new green economy uh, and that will in turn help uh, support new design, manufacturing, construction, and, and sales, um, all of these industries benefiting from all of that. So uh, the panel itself is uh, still assessing uh, balanced initiatives um, and incentives uh, and regulatory policies that will look at, that are looking at um, increasing the sale of medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicles to 30% of all new vehicles sold by 2030 and 100% of all light duty zero emission vehicles by 2035. Strategies under consideration also include, in addition to the minimum sales mandates, also include 
um, incentivizing incremental costs through scrappage and fee bait programs, uh, direct support for make ready and charging infrastructure, and financing strategies uh, to harness private investment. So additional consideration uh, of these policies and strategies um, is necessary to better address our equity concerns uh, for disadvantaged and rural communities. And uh, that goes directly to access affordability um, for planned investments and the benefits that are associated with all of that. All right, next slide, please. All right, next area is clean fuels. So, although our primary emphasis is on accelerating electrification of the transportation sector, the panel has identified 2 primary roles for low carbon biofuels. The 1st is for use in harder to electrify transportation modes, like aviation and long distance trucking. And the 2nd, to reduce emissions in the interim, uh, as we move toward electrification and other modes, uh, like medium and heavy duty trucking. Uh, a few things that the advisory panel is keeping in mind, uh, not all biofuels provide the same benefit. Uh, we need, we need look, we're looking to focus on those that result in greater emission reductions of both GHG and importantly, co-pollutants like the particulates found in uh, diesel exhaust. Um, we're also looking to consider uh, life cycle emissions. So we need to consider siting of renewable um, and clean fuel uh, productions as well as storage um, uh, facilities as well. And we want to avoid strategies that extend reliance on fossil fuel infrastructure. So as we look forward um, from an equity perspective, the panel wants to make sure to ensure that the availability of lower carbon biofuels does, doesn't interfere. Uh, with moving forward on electrification in the areas of heavy duty or heavy truck traffic. Um, but we also think that communities can still benefit from the interim um, in the interim from biofuels and uh, lower levels of particulates in particular. Uh, a low carbon fuel standard is one policy that's under consideration, but the panel is also looking at, at uh, other policy approaches as well. So if we could go to the third slide, please. On the public transportation front, uh, one of the greatest uh, opportunities to help bridge the council's emphasis on energy efficiency, housing and land use is to strategically invest in high quality and high frequency public transportation services. Um, for the purpose of, of uh, today, the transportation advisory panel is really looking at defining public transportation broadly to include transit. Micro micro transit uh, shared mobility, whether that's any of the car share services, uh, as well as uh, longer distance passenger rail uh, services. Through integrated transportation options and complementary land use policies, the panel is exploring policies and programs that double the availability and accessibility of upstate and downstate suburban public transportation services by 2035. In addition, consideration is being provided to prioritizing investments in the Metropolitan Commuter uh, Transportation District to support the renewal and modernization of existing transit services and the expansion needs, keeping in mind the expansion needs of MTA. As the panel considers funding and finance strategies to support these policies, consideration has to be given to ensure the affordability of public transportation options including last mile connectivity, as well as prioritizing the availability of options in rural and underserved um, and unserved communities across the state. Also land use policies, uh, you know, we've also come to realize um, very clearly that land use policies should recognize that the integration of mobility options uh, has to begin and end with safe and accessible pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure as well. The advisory panel will also assess strategies that address barriers to making public transportation options easier to use, including deploying next vehicle technologies that provide updates on availability of public transportation options, as well as interactive schedules and itinerary planning. 
In addition, we're gonna we're looking at reassessing the traditional performance measures for evaluating transportation investments, which incentivize uh, you know car centric uh, priorities and projects. Um, an example of that, um, you know, kind of the level of of service as opposed to uh, greenhouse gas reduction. Potential changes in existing federal rules are also being looked at. Looking at um, you know the constraints on longer range planning uh, that are out there, how do we make sure that we address some of those uh, federal constraints that are, are presently in place? So, last group here um, is uh, if you can advance the slide, slide please, is really focused um, on smart growth and transportation efficiency, system efficiency across the board. Uh, the advisory panel, uh, as we look at things that got under consideration, um, we're really assessing the linkage between planning and development and, uh, and smart growth as an approach as a, uh, as a direct approach to achieving the, um, efficiencies that can be gained, uh, when we travel, uh, and move, uh, in amongst our daily destinations. So that first mile, last last mile connectivity uh, to transit and across the board to where we're headed and why we're going there. How do we get there most efficiently? These location efficient uh, efficiencies help limit vehicle miles traveled. Uh, they also uh, decrease the trips and the distance between those destinations. Um, we're looking at reducing the number of car trips necessary for daily activities. Uh, making the public transportation system more accessible and providing for mode shifting uh, from, you know, across the board, uh, really looking at mobility alternatives like walking, biking, mass transit, and obviously micro transit. Uh, the panel is also engaged in working with the land use and local government advisory panel to make sure that all of these policies align in a way that uh, is uh, strategic and it makes sense. Um, we're also considering two overarching strategies that have really emerged to guide the development uh, for the panel's recommendations, specifically around transportation oriented development or TOD, uh, which really looks at aligning the roadway, um, residential and commercial development uh, to be proximate and accessible to public transportation. So oftentimes uh, transportation oriented development is intentionally broader than the traditional notion of um, TOD, but what we're really focused on is transit oriented development. How do we make sure that we capitalize on all of that? Um, because we really need to broaden the frame to uh, achieve these ambitious goals that we have under the CLCPA. The other area, uh, the other uh, overarching strategy is uh, addressing low carbon transportation modes um, and really expanding the access to low and no carbon transportation modes for first and last mile connections to transit uh, and other destinations. So whether that's biking, walking, carpooling, any kind of, any kind of micro transit. Uh, we're also uh, focused on expanding access to public transportation that can have positive impacts uh, for uh, lower income uh, households and disadvantaged communities by addressing um, spatial mismatches, if you will, between folks whose income uh, may be lower um, and they often tend to spend more in a very disproportionate amount of time um, as well as the amount of their income in actually commuting to work. So that disproportion um, is really quite significant. So this level of uh, engagement in terms of really looking at um, how we adjust those uh, transit times uh, to and from work um, oftentimes are directly correlated to income levels. We need to look to see how we can make sure that we can provide more transit, more transportation opportunities that are uh, cognizant of our overall goals here. So uh, this is particularly, I think, a good time uh, to address uh, this disparity as we plan for uh, just transition into our, 
our uh, clean energy economy. I think um, the transportation advisory panel is more than cognizant of that uh, as we undertake our work. And lastly, we're really looking into ways to support smart growth planning and development in areas that are aligned with uh, transit investments and projects that improve the safety and ease of use of low carbon transportation modes for first and last mile trips. So, uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, that is the uh, the transportation advisory panel, as we like to call it, the TAP. Um, outline of what we're had, what we're looking at. Thank you, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, I see we have a few questions here. I'll start from the top. Anne. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hey. Thanks so much for that presentation, Commissioner. I really appreciate it. I had a couple questions. Um, one was on the, the the slide about clean fuels. You mentioned you're looking at low carbon fuel standard, but you're also looking at other things. And I was wondering what those were. The second question is which of the subgroup is looking at the transportation climate initiative? And then the third question is related it's on about money you know i guess the maybe not a question more an observation on the transit one i mean i i don't think that investments in transit um would be controversial but for how it's going to pay for you know it's it's one of the absolute best things you can do to reduce emissions reduce vehicle miles travel improve mobility and equity and I'm sure there's no shortage of ideas for transit at MTA or the tra other transit agencies or DOT, but the problem is how to pay for it. And I was just wondering how the that subgroup is balancing its discussion of transit improvements that are necessary or how to pay for them. So can I just ask Anne, what was what was the first question that you asked? Um, under low carbon fuel standard standard slide there you mentioned we're looking at low carbon fuel standard and other policies and i was wondering what they were and then the so second the, question was which one's looking at tci so we're looking across the board um i'll i'll start off with low carbon fuel standards it's one of many things that i think that are out there that we need to look at so the there's nothing that's off the table right now um in terms of things that the the panel is actually um got under consideration. Um, with regard to TCI, it's the same, it's the same approach. TCI is one of, um, of many things, as you know, TCI is a regional um, approach to, uh, that's under consideration, but I think that the work of the Climate Action Council um, is one that is uh, comprehensive in terms of what New York is looking at. So as we move forward, um, obviously TCI is, uh, is uh, one of the many things that, uh, one of the many elements, one of the many tools that's out there that we can consider, um, uh, that the state writ large can consider. But the, the bottom line is, is that with regard to uh, transportation and the TAP, it's obviously uh, one of many things that's looking at a, you know, um, a model for how we actually address this. It's not, but, I, I will say it's a regional approach. It's not specific to New York. Obviously, uh, there's more to that. With regard to transit, I think that I could have started off literally um, uh, talking about uh, how we actually need to fundamentally pay for our transit systems um, across the board. Um, we have, you know, the level of advocacy right now in terms of making sure that there's local aid uh, to support states, um, given uh, everything that we're dealing with with regard to COVID uh, is critical. Uh, you've seen Congress literally today. Um, it doesn't look like they're advancing anything on that front. Uh, our level of advocacy starts with that local aid uh, at the federal level and the need for it. Um, and moves from there uh, directly to transportation um, funding writ large uh, for all of the states, in particular for, for New York, given our needs, uh, given the significant challenges that MTA and all the transit systems are facing right now. Bob, you have your hand up? Uh, yeah, yes, I do, Th thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for a, 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 a great overview of what you're doing. I, I think most of it sounds uh, really fantastic. I, I love the electrification that you started with, public transportation planning and all. Uh, one small question and then a bigger comment or question. Uh, you know, I, I live in a rural area. I'd love to see more uh, electric buses start to come into our upstate New York area. And I'm wondering, you know, if, if you can consider uh, pushing electric buses, both urban and rural environments, including school buses, something I've raised before. It seems to me to be one of the low hanging fruit. So that's that's the easy uh, thought. The, but let me raise the more difficult one. Uh, and that goes back to the renewable biofuels and also green hydrogen. And uh, Peter expressed some worries a bit ago. I, I share his concerns and worries. Uh, let, let me just say for green hydrogen, uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical that we're going to be able to generate a significant amount of green hydrogen, true green hydrogen, and it of course opens the door to generating hydrogen from natural gas, which I'm very concerned about. Uh, and to the extent we have surplus renewable electricity, there are far more efficient ways to to store and use it than to generate hydrogen. And so I, I, I want to be careful that the uh, panels are cognizant of that, and at least my concern as a member of the Climate Action Council as we go ahead, I would personally like to steer you away from that. In terms of the uh, renewable biofuels, I do see a role for them as a uh, transitional fuel until we can uh, move towards uh, full electrification. But getting the life cycle assessments right is critical. Getting the boundaries on those is, is critical. And I, I think this is something, again, the whole council needs to pay very, very close attention to. And I'm, uh, I've am i worked a lot in that area myself over decades, and, and I've seen it done well, and I've seen it done very poorly. And it's, it's critical that if we're going to uh, seriously use biofuels as part of the CLCPA uh, solution, we really need to do it right. So, again, thank, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Gavin. Gavin. Kevin, you're on mute if you're talking. Am I off? Okay. Commissioner, thanks for the information. Uh, a question that I, I'm trying to understand since it was brought up is uh, where, where is the state of New York today on TCI? Have we made it this? I don't follow it, Basil, maybe like you do, but I, I, you know, I follow Reggie a lot closer. I'm just trying to figure out since it was brought up where we are with TCI today. Well, Gavin, I think you know we've been a been a, uh, a, a cooperating state over the last few years. Um, that's still the case. Um, we're, New York's made no decision on it. We're taking, uh, uh, you know, our time to understand it and understand all the feedback from all the sides. But at this point, no uh, no decisions been made. Okay. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, let's see, Raya. Oh, I just wanted to comment that I, I certainly, you know, listening to um, Peter and Bob talk about the the limitations of the pathways analysis with regard to life cycle and co pollutants and the really real need to get that right. Um, just would love to see, you know, to see that happen so that there can be just real strong guidance, you know, on on these issues for this panel and others. We certainly we're certainly hearing hearing your comments directly. So thank you. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Commission. Good job. All right. Chair Rhodes, you are up next. Thank you very 20 much. Minutes. Um can folks hear me? You can. Good. So I'm John Rhodes. Um, I'm here as the uh, chair of uh, the Power uh, Generation Advisory Panel. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we've done is organized ourselves into subgroups like everybody else, equity, barriers, solutions for the future, and resource mix. Um, and in each case, in each subgroup, there's, you know, obviously a sub-agenda, community impact, access, and affordability, Workforce development, clean energy siting, 
clean energy delivery and hosting capacity, uh, technology and research needs, and new market solutions needs. Um, and then the resource mix is probably where a lot of the um, complexity really shows up, which is uh, the growth and how to do it of renewable energy and energy efficiency, um, and a transition away from the fossil fuel uh, kind of solutions. And meanwhile, uh, upping the uh, deployment of energy storage and distributed um, energy resources. Um, so the next slides um, are going to go through uh, specific strategies. But before we do that, just a couple of um, public service announcements. First of all, there's a lot here in these slides. My job today is to point out what is in here, not to go through the details. So please offline find time to dig in. Obviously, we'll take questions today, but there'll be plenty of other windows and the invitation, the door is always open for questions. Also, um, this is uh, an interim presentation. So uh, my colleagues on the panel uh, completely reserve the right to amend our recommendations as our deliberations continue and as we learn new things, and especially as we get into the cross-panel discussions that we've all discussed and we know are in the works. So, um, first recommendation slide, um, it's an equity subgroup, which is to focus on community impact. Um, we're seeking here to proactively advance the opportunities to address disparities around uh, resources that communities host. Um, we know that we have disproportionate impacts that we'd like to reduce in overburdened communities. Um, that have too much of the high emission power generation facilities and not enough of the clean alternatives like renewable energy and energy efficiency. And uh, a strategy, a recommendation should be to focus on uh, reversing that balance and uh, also on delivering, making sure that the other community impacts like loss of jobs as we reduce some of these uh, dirtier plants um, are handled and so that investment and compensating employment opportunity for community members and for workforces at those facilities continues. Um, so that's the heart of the first recommendation. Next slide, please. Uh, the next recommendation relates to, um, you know, making sure that all New Yorkers have uh, a meaningful opportunity to participate in New York's clean energy future as a matter of access, I can get to clean solar, and as a matter of affordability, it helps my energy bill. Um, so uh, we have to invest in residential, i.e. directed at families and households, energy efficiency and clean energy solutions um, in a manner that benefits all New Yorkers, uh, but especially disadvantaged communities that have not received their fair share of the benefits to date, i.e. low and moderate income households and small businesses and the like. Um, we need to attend to costs, upfront costs, future ongoing costs, how we can afford those, how we can subsidize them so as not to increase energy burden on, on low income residents and on small businesses. Um, these communities also face, you know, real issues around um, being locked out of certain options, like if you're a renter or if you're in subsidized housing, say public housing, uh, some of these uh, opportunities are not available to you today. Um, and in general, um, true among all New Yorkers, but especially problematic for our agenda is the issue of awareness and spreading um, information out uh, to members of these communities. A um, couple of principles, and one main principle that low income New Yorkers really cannot bear the brunt of the burden for this transition, nor can they bear the brunt of the burden of uh, assets that may no longer need be needed in the future. Um, and the devil is going to be in the details on this and making sure that actually our strategies flow through to benefits and equity of access and affordability for those resources. Um, next slide, rec slide three of 10. Um, this goes to workforce um, and really focusing our recommendations to enable an equitable clean energy workforce. 
Um, we know that disadvantages communities already suffer disproportionately and have disproportionately poor access um, to uh, the job engine that the clean energy transition can be. So invest in workforce development, um, target it, and make sure that those investments are uh, aggressive and durable. Apprenticeship programs, free apprenticeship, high school, pre-high school, work with existing programs, Green City Forest, Sustainable South Bronx, we act, the list is, is long and rich. Uh, that's, that's, that's a great thing. Work with local uh, communities and state agencies to make sure that the jobs are New York jobs and work not just on the projects, but also on the supply chain. If a company sets up business to, you know, to make things in New York, um, that's an opportunity too. Uh, in all this, we want to both make sure that we're um, tending to the needs of um, the folks that need jobs and don't have a fair crack at them, but also um, to the folks that are in jobs now at facilities that may have a cir circumscribed future, and how do we, um, how do we work uh, for them as well, um, and here especially jointly with the Just Transition Working Group. Um, and we know that many of these jobs, like offshore wind and steel workers and uh, certain building, building facility management workers are going to be unionized. They're going to have good quality of job protections. Um, but across the board in these clean energy jobs, we want to make sure that it's not just the job, but the wages and benefits and protections that are high quality as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, switching gears now, those were, those were all around equity. Now we're talking about barriers. So one set of barriers that, that loom large for us is siting. Um, we know we're going to have, we're going to want and need rapid deployment of renewables to meet our ambitious but achievable CLCPA goals, 70 by 30, 100 by 40. Um, optimizing the locations of the projects um, is going to be necessary. Um, to meet the timeline and to make sure that the transition of the grid is as um, successful and effective and also efficient and cost effective as possible. Um, <clears throat> we need to make sure that the benefits from these renewables flow both to rural communities, which are often the, um, uh, the hosts of a lot of the larger facilities, um, as well as to the urban communities uh, which may not see enough of the, of the co-benefits. Um, so figuring out sort of principles of justice that can make sure that the benefits flow to both the community, host communities and to uh, the not yet participating sufficiently communities. Um, generally coordinating our processes better between siting the facility that's going to make the energy and site the facilities that are going to transport the energy, transmit the energy, um, and um, figuring out how to take advantage of new solutions when it comes to siting and transmission. Uh, business as usual, which is just go lay some copper, is probably not the way to go. Um, we know that there's a lot of new solutions that make things more possible, and let's take full advantage of, of those. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so five. Um, Fifth slide, um, energy delivery and hosting capacity. Um, in large part, this is transmission, but not just transmission. It's all about how getting, getting renewable energy to the customer in the right place and at the right time, and how can we increase our capacity to do that? Um, transmission, hosting, interconnection capacity. Um, again, uh, developing principles of justice to make sure that the benefits of this set of investments flow to all communities, including impacted communities and disadvantaged communities. Um, and again, this is one of those devil in the details uh, projects, smooth out the process. Um, we know we have um, problems with an infrastructure that like much of our infrastructure in New York is aged and needs updating. Um, and uh, we've got to make sure that the, cost, um, the costs are spread fairly and efficiently um, to uh, the communities and folks that are affected. Next slide, um, now switching from barrier, and we've done equity, we've done barriers. The next subgroup up is needs for the future, future solutions. 
um, well, there's technology and innovation and research. Um, we know we're going to need a variety of energy technologies uh, to meet the CLCPA goals by 2030, but even more essential by 2040 to effectively transition to a system that we still has to be affordable and reliable, as well as clean. As well as clean, we know we need to pick the technologies uh, that, that are going to be most useful to us, obviously include storage, obviously include high tech and command control and communications, um, and as well as um, other kind of capacity increasing um, new kinds of uh, local storage, smarter buildings and the like. Um, we know that we need to engage these technologies. We know that we need to accelerate the timeframes um, where they come on stream. Um, and we need to be open-minded and retain flexibility because um, we know that uh, new technologies are gonna show up, new solutions that we can't even really imagine yet. All we have to do is look back five years ago, um, we would not have picked um, the kind of solutions that we really know today are gonna be so powerful, such as offshore wind, um, and figure out how to kind of fund uh, the acceleration of these new solutions into practical reality. Um, next slide, slide seven, um, market solutions. Um, not only do the technologies have to work, um, they have to make economic sense. So we need to find a way for them to be good investments, which among other things means earn revenues. So how do, uh, how do these new kinds of resources get access to the revenues um, in a way that maximizes their potential to contribute uh, to the system. Um, so this is where we get a little bit wonky, but uh, a term, important term of art is price signals, um, and they need to be correct, and they need to be uh, granular. Um, we know that the markets have to deliver those price signals, the markets have to make sure that they're incorporating um, system aspects, system benefits, and system costs um, to make sure that they kind of all land in the right place. Um, and we know we've got a lot of smart people that have been working on how to get the markets right for New York to date. Um, we're gonna need that same level of smarts, but not for the solutions we have in place, but for forward looking uh, market designs um, as we go forward. Um, and again, there's a set of technical aspects that are gonna be important here participation rules, tariff design, market rules, uh, new market products, retail rate structures, and the like. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, resource mix. Um, this is where we start getting into um, some of the more uh, trade-off-y kind of issues. Um, we know, but this is a simple one, the first recommendation is really to drive hard on the clean resources, mainly renewable and generation and energy efficiency. Um, we know uh, we need a lot more of them. Um, we know that we, our electricity is supposed to get much more clean and much more renewable by 2030 and 24. And we also know we're gonna need a lot more electricity um, as buildings clean up and electrify and as vehicles clean up and electrify. Um, so uh, that's a lot more renewables. Um, and how do we kind of uh, get those to be as positive as possible? Um, we do know we need to address uh, community concerns, in some cases, community opposition. Um, there has to be a way for this to be win-win as much as possible. Um, and uh, we need to arrive at solutions that work for everybody, that are accessible for everybody, and that keep costs affordable for everybody. Um, when we build a, a clean energy resource, we want it to operate as fully as possible and minimize what's called a curtailment um, and generally optimize investments in the resource. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of work, um, especially we need to be thinking about how to get renewables downstate. Um, can we um, either get uh, highways to take uh, the upstate or offshore uh, clean energy into downstate, or can we find ways to site uh, these new resources downstate, uh, especially challenging knowing that there's 
a real reality of, of space limitations. Um, and all this energy efficiency, energy conservation um, is going to be a massive enabler. Um, as we, the next slide, slide nine, as we ramp up uh, the clean resources, we need to effectively transition away from the fossil resources. Um, how do we do that uh, right now? Uh, they're important to, uh, to maintaining reliability and safety. We can't give up on those principles, uh, but um, you know we can't. We also can't live with business as usual reliance on older fossil fuel-fired peaking resources, um, that especially since those are the ones that are um, at the root of many of the disproportionate impacts on on their local communities, which are environmental justice communities. Um, so we need a, a, a transition uh, away from fossil that is careful and smart um, and protects those principles of reliability and safety, yet swift and certain. Um, we can't just keep on keeping on. So some of the questions that we're still working is how long a ramp, um, how can we uh, move best, how can we move most quickly to transition? Um, is there a way, for instance, to take better uh, uh, advantage of the last year's DEC PICA rules um, and what is the resource mix that really helps us get there fast and meanwhile while we're at it, um, let's, fret, let's, let's pay special attention to upstream for as long as we have fossil fuels, mainly gas. Um, we're buying uh, a future of some leakage and what can we do about methane leakage um, upstream and those infrastructures. Um, and then the final set of recommendations um, uh, is, uh, you know, goes to some of the newer, more distributed resources, energy storage, um, local solar, um, that really can um, shift uh, the usage pattern and make the, the larger uh, renewable energy generating uh, more suitable for the system and make the system more suitable for them, taking into account siting, Take and citing, taking into account community values and concerns, making sure again that these resources, which are going to be local, also provide local benefits. Again, especially making sure um, that they do that to the communities that so far have been um, have been especially burdened. Um, so that's a fast tour. I'm sorry for um, the speed uh, uh, the speedy tour, but. Um, there's a lot here. The panel has made a lot of progress, um, not only identifying the issues, um, but also beginning to grapple with them. Um, and we look forward to questions now and uh, along the way and input now and along the way. John, thank you. Um, I see Dennis has a question. Uh, John, uh, it's a mouthful that you covered. Um, yes, sorry. How do we, so one of the concerns that I have is that we, we seem to chase uh, these issues. So we create uh, all of these renewable energy, large scale renewable energy project, we build the queue uh, and then we have the queue in place. Uh, and then the T&D working group of the joint utilities come out and say in order to then deliver on, you know, the projects that we know of in phase one at 6.83 billion. Uh, phase two up to $10.4 billion. Uh, and then um, Doreen put together, which I thought was a great uh, uh, workshop on deep decarbonization. Uh, but again, uh, part of that as well as E3 indicates then that our demand increases as we decarbonize could be 65 to 80%. So then what will the utilities do to respond to that? Uh, they'll look at what is the then uh, distribution investment uh, that's required to deliver on that as well. How do you envision, um, you know, kind of like creating a much more efficient uh, market structure as you analyze this that actually always balances supply, demand, and delivery as we go through this process? And, and do you envision other groups or what other groups do you envision being part of that dialogue? Well, I think you put uh, uh, 
I think you put your, your finger on one of the central challenges, um, and it's one that, um, you know, the colleagues on the panel are, are working hard uh, to do, which is as we add a lot more resources that are clean and as we, uh, that, and that have characteristics that are quite different, i.e. less dispatchable and more, um, more intermittent, how do we preserve um, reliability and safety, especially as we add more kinds of load like buildings and vehicles. So that's obviously a challenge. Um, uh, and, but I, it, it's fairly clear that there's a suite of solutions that um, are, uh, are extremely promising, right? So there's, we know we can build transmission um, and under the governor, uh, we, we know we can build it faster than we have. Um, we know then there's some new solutions like storage, not new, but it's just getting better all the time, um, and other ways of having flexible load. So we need to bring those on. Um, my own view is that, um, you know, there's a huge set of opportunities here. Um, we're going to benefit from, you know, progress on all fronts. Um, we're going to benefit from uh, the pace of whatever technology innovation that's happening, fan storage, and we've talked about that. Um, the, the state, for the first time, um, uh, again, under the governor's direction, um, or determined uh, on a power grid study, which is the first comprehensive look on what the transmission needs are. Um, you know, across the spectrum, onshore into all, on, uh, offshore into onshore, um, upstate to downstate, um, at the bulk level and at the di distribution level. You've referenced some of the, um, the emerging um, placeholders from those studies, um, and those all will, um, will come online. I think we're going to know a lot more in a couple of months, when these, in a month or so, when these studies are out. But uh, my early understanding is that we're actually in pretty good shape um, over the next decade or so to A, bring on the clean resources, and B, to integrate them into the system that we need. Um, and we've got some ideas on how to do better um, over the decade after that. So um, it's complicated and it's really important, but um, I think we're going to find um, as we work this through um, and come to recommendations, you know, whatever, but by March or April of next year, that we're not in bad shape. Um, we've put a lot of pieces in, into place in this state, um, and I don't think it's luck. I think it's, uh, you know, it's smart ambition um, that's gotten us to where we are. And, and John, just I appreciate that. Just I would offer, and maybe I'd offer to Gavin that uh, I spent 30 years in the utility space, um, we tend to look at it from a utility point of view from a policy driven down or top down. Uh, it's time we start looking at it from the point of use or market driven demand upward. And so I, I just think we got a great opportunity of thinking about the energy industry from an efficient market system uh, like no other time before. I, I just think this is an exciting uh, approach. Uh, certainly, I, I, I applaud the efforts of you and your team of putting together what you did. So thank you for that. Agreed. Okay. Paul. Hey, John, lots of great work being done here. I'm wondering, you know, I'm really fascinated by the distributed energy opportunity and uh, I'd like to hear just a few comments about the analysis you've done uh, about the relative benefits of, of small scale sort of community based power generation not just from a you know relative economic standpoint but but there's or I wonder that there is an agility benefit that, that small communities have the ability in principle to do their own creative financing and develop uh, projects in, in ways that, 
that can spin up much faster. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you can comment about, you know, how, how um, this group is is looking at, at all the benefits of the range of scales, but specifically uh, community scale distributed energy. Um, so that's obviously a pretty um, a pretty rich topic, um, and I can't really do justice to the answer, but I would say um, there are, uh, you know, three or four aspects that, that, that are really important about uh, distributed resources. So one is um, they may not be uh, kind of plain vanilla to plain vanilla uh, as cheap as um, bulk resources, so a five megawatt solar plant may be less efficient than a hundred megawatt solar plant, but in the right place, they can be just as valuable. Um, and so that's kind of one, one realization um, that, that, we, that, we're, that, we're, that we're able to recognize. Um, the second is that if you're going to um, have a system that's, that's flexible, um, you're going to need um, resources that are close to the load. Um, not only those resources, but among other things, and again, um, local solar, local storage plus solar, local storage um, are gonna be a really important part of the mix. Um, third, you know, I think that um, it's fairly clear that um, the, uh, we just know for a fact that the current energy system um, does not spread uh, the environmental and then health burden equally. Um, and as we think about solutions for the places where justice and now the law just demands that we do something about it, um, these are the kind of solutions that are going to be um, a part of the mix. And then finally, um, in general, I think that our, our system of the future is just has to have uh, and we agree, I think we all agree, I, I may be getting a little bit ahead of my team and I apologize to colleagues if I am. We just know that flexibility matters, um, especially as we have more load and we really don't care where the flexibility comes from. But again, a lot of it's going to be distributed, whether it's local generation or local storage or, uh, you know, a building that's smart and able to control its load. So I think those are all factors that make us very interested in DER. Okay, John, thanks. This panel's running way over. <clears throat> We've got two more questions, if we can do those quickly from uh, Gavin and then Ann. Go ahead, Gavin. Um, John, thank you. Um, as part of, of all the information you put out, the, it's, it seems to me that the, the working group is prioritizing the words you used, market, market solutions, getting price signals correct, uh, getting the markets to work correctly, look forward. Those are all really bu good buzzwords for the folks I work for. But the one thing I didn't hear you mention today, and I don't know if it's being considered in the working group, is carbon pricing. Uh, you know, we firmly believe, and I, and I know many on this group believe that carbon pricing could be the next iteration of a market outcome to help achieve a lot of our statutory mandates. So is that something that this working group has been discussing as part of that market solution? Uh, sure, we've discussed it. It's come up, um, and it's getting some attention. Um, I'll just <clears throat> I'll just observe that um, there's also um, that's also somewhat of a climate action council uh, agenda topic. Um, so uh, I think collectively we're going to have to sort out where that resides. But I agree, it's hard to imagine us getting through. Uh, you know, through this topic to agenda to recommendations that we believe in that that don't figure out um, a position on carbon pricing. Okay, Ann. Hey, thank you so much, Chairman. Um, I had a couple observations on barrier. Those thoughts about barriers. Um, you know, to me, this is this is really the crux of the matter. Is what are the barriers to getting renewable energy projects built? Um, I didn't see mention of the interconnection process at the ISO, which still remains a very lengthy process with a 
small throughput, uh, a throughput of megawatts that doesn't okay, add up so, to getting uh, consistent. So in spirit, that was on the slides. In spirit, that okay. was on the slides. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Good, <is there? laughs> I'll try not to make <laughs> any ghost jokes. Um, I was happy to see taxation there because that is another barrier. The um, property um, standardization of property taxation. Um, and I guess their answer will probably be in spirit here too. The the slides seem to have the flavor of like the permitting project pro problems are behind us. And I very much hope that that's true with the new 94 C process and the new office. Um, but from the point of view of developers, it's it's it you know they're still waiting and seeing if the mitigation of for all the different things that's in the regulations ends up being cost prohibitive, then that that still remains a barrier. So I do think it's worth um, consideration by the committee to to note that that we're we're not all the way through fixing permitting. Um, and noted. Um, yeah. Okay. I was wondering too on the solutions for the future slide if the group had talked about defining them or defining criteria for them. It seems like it would get at this controversy about bioenergy in some way. Um, I know you want to keep it open enough to encompass that emissions free innovation that we don't hasn't been invented yet, but it seems to me that that effort would be facilitated by somehow defining what emissions free means and what the innovative solutions of the future would have to have as um, operating criteria. So, um, so we're, there, there are probably limitations on how much technical expertise we can bring to that, but we'll do our best to grapple with that solution. But, um, as you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging one. Okay. All right. This has been a good conversation, guys. I'm going to cut it off right here so we can get along to the next panel. Um, John, thank you. Um, I don't know, Gertler, if you can um, maybe get, get a little more nimble and make some some time up there. But uh, excited to hear about what the work your uh, your panel's up to on energy intensive and trade exposed industries. Eric, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. I will certainly try to be nimble and make up some time. I want to first acknowledge and thank both, uh, both you, Basil, and you, Doreen, for your great leadership um, on, this, uh, uh, on, on this Climate Action Council. So, so thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Pleasure to, uh, to talk to you um, and talk to you about the strategies that we are considering for our advisory panel on, on energy intensive and trade uh, exposed industries. And what we are looking to do is look at finding strategies to mitigate the impact of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so, uh, by way of background, so far we've had we've had five meetings. We've had uh, great input from our our panel members. And uh, tomorrow we're meeting with the climate justice uh, working group. Um, and then next month we will uh, look for and seek uh, public public input. So on on this this slide, uh, let me give you some context for uh, our discussions first. When we estimate uh, industrial emission uh, and industrial uh, activities, we're, we're really looking at 7% of state emissions for our industries, which are uh, primarily manufacturing, uh, mining, um, and, and construction. And these are emissions that come from, you know, on-site fuel combustion or even non-combustion non uh, industrial processes and then indirect emissions from from electricity. So everything from gas delivered for on-site for heat for burning to processes uh, where there's no burning per se, but the process leads to uh, carbon dioxide uh, being emitted. Uh, second, when we look at all the industrial activities, we realize that um, it's not homogeneous, it's very diverse. Um, and so across all the industries, uh, there's you know different factories, different industries, uh, and that means that there's no uh, one size fits all here um, and will likely uh, require some customized uh, solutions that are industry specific and even facilities uh, specific. 
Uh, third, third point is that when um, uh, we look uh, within sort of industries in general, the, um, the EITE industries represent a pretty high share of the industry sector emissions. Um, and so, uh, you know, so uh, we have sought to emphasize approaches to mitigate the potential for emissions leakage, um, you know, incentive order uh, approaches, uh, which may be more likely and more likely under mandate-based schemes. And then, and then lastly, um, you know, given the nature of, of the um, uh, industry and sort of the, uh, the focus on uh, technology, uh, we're likely to see near-term uh, near emission reductions uh, to, to result from more efficiency uh, measures in some electrification um, while deeper decarbonization, which require more technological innovation, that'll occur over the, over the long term. And that, uh, you know, particularly with our analysis with, with E3, the consensus is that uh, that deep decarbonization uh, with our, within our sector is likely to be backloaded in later years as more technology begins to emerge, becomes techno, uh, technologically viable and cost effective. Uh, let's go to the next slide and start to talk about some of our approaches. So uh, with these considerations in mind, we've reviewed a number of different uh, efforts that other jurisdictions have identified, um, and we've come up with the following approaches to reduce or mitigate uh, industrial emissions. So first, uh, financial assistance, uh, technical assistance, uh, low-carbon procurement and supply chain policies. Of course, I'm going to get into more detail on all of this. Research development and demonstration innovation, workforce development, and emission reporting. And then I also highlight economic incentives as a way to grow our uh, green economic uh, opportunities within the state. Um, and I can tell you at, at ESD, we are already using some of the uh, economic incentives in the green economy to stimulate uh, that part of our economy. Uh, next slide, please. Great, thank you. So um, our, our first strategy is that we would seek to provide technical assistance and financial incentives for industrial decarbonization with targeted outreach to facilities located in disadvantaged communities to reduce emissions. So. Specifically, with respect to technical assistance, we would help in identifying uh, economically viable decarbonization pathways and also help in comprehensive energy management uh, planning. Um, and the financial assistance incentives would be used to help support those decarbonization projects. Uh, in addition, uh, we would leverage the state's low-cost and clean hydropower to provide support for, for industry, and we know that NIPA produces a lot of the, you know, clean energy. Uh, in addition to helping businesses overcome the financial challenges of transitioning to clean energy, this strategy is also intended to help industry understand its options and feel confident in its investment decisions. So, for example, there may be some risk aversion to solutions that uh, may interrupt their industrial processes. It may save the business money. Uh, it may be uh, more efficient. It may be a good way to go forward, but um, they just need the guidance. That would be part of, of the strategy. Uh, we also know that in many cases, uh, some of these facilities or industries lack uh, in-house expertise in terms of energy management, given sort of the newness uh, of all this, and there's also a lack of trust and a lack of knowledge uh, that the solutions will provide the intended benefits. So all of that are areas in which uh, we would look to provide uh, assistance. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so for our second strategy, we would propose procurement-based incentives for businesses to offer lower carbon goods and services. This is you know, by and large, a new strategy for, uh, for New York State. This would be done by creating market opportunities for low-carbon 
products via public procurement. And in this case, we would require the adoption of preferential standards for state procurements with building uh, materials as one potential example. So those of you who are well-schooled um, in this, which most of you are, think, think like California, which has uh, its Buy Clean program. And then in addition to reducing the state's environmental impact, successful implementation of this strategy would also provide a revenue stream for businesses that produce low carbon products. And this will again continue to position New York State as a leader um, in, in these markets. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Great. Um, third, we would provide support for uh, technological uh, advancement. Uh, and, you know, as I talked at the, at the beginning, you know, near term, the reductions would really be focused on how do we do energy efficiency and increased electric, electrification. You know, over the long term, as we want deeper industrial decarbonization, that really depends on the development and the innovation of, of new techniques uh, and new technologies, rather. So, um, in this case, uh, we, we've considered a number of different ways that we can advance the development and deployment of, of these tech technologies. Um, think about it from the context that this is an industrial sector that doesn't have the tech technology wherewithal. So as a state, we would help to look for the gaps uh, in a way that we can help all uh, industries and figure out a way to also uh, help uh, a number of the facilities within, within those industries. So uh, things, uh, for example, that we've discussed is developing an innovation a roadmap, uh, which would address those knowledge gaps and provide a guide to key priorities towards necessary decarbonization technologies. We've also talked about providing early stage R&D funding. So that really helps to uh, build, you know, new startup companies that will help to think about some of the new technologies uh, that are needed um, in this field, uh, supporting demonstration and pilot projects for high impact solutions. And then also um, identifying the potential for innovation clusters to leverage supply chains and infrastructure. All of this helping to seed um, new companies that help to provide new technologies to help foster reduced emissions um, in, in this space. And, uh, you know, we as a panel have also given a lot of consideration to uh, equity and environmental justice, and so we would ensure that that's part of some of the funding uh, recommendations that we're always thinking about communities that are disadvantaged. Uh, next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, there would also need to be a workforce uh, development strategy to expand the state's green workforce and match the supply and demand of decarbonization skills. So um, in the short term, um, even when we think about energy monitoring and management, there would need to be training um, on, on that and making sure that we have the right people um, so, uh, so that this can be achieved. Critical to be able to reduce emissions through energy efficient me measures um, and having uh, those individuals who are skilled to, to understand that. Now, you know, in the longer term, as we've talked about, as we get into deeper uh, decarbonization, um, and as te those technologies become available, um, there'll be a greater need for training workers on those developing and new, new techno technologies. Uh, clearly, until we have a sense of what those technologies are, those programs uh, and those workforce strategies will be um, uh, delayed until those technologies are, are put into place. But uh, no question, that uh, workforce development strategy here can play a key role in addressing the equity considerations, uh, and we can target opportunities uh, to disadvantage individuals and also to MWBE firms. Okay, next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, we would also propose to increase the collection of greenhouse gas emissions uh, data so uh, today there are many emission sources 
that are not required to be reported to the state, um, including some that are required to be reported to, to the EPA. And so the goal here is to identify some of that data that would be helpful what we're trying to achieve, but at the same time making sure that it's not too burdensome because uh, while we want the data to help us figure out uh, smart strategies, um, we don't want to create uh, too much of an administrative nightmare for some of these uh, for some of these companies. So, uh, you know, collecting data from a large universe uh, of industrial facilities certainly would help us. It helps us track our emissions reduction progress, and it also helps us prioritize uh, our efforts accordingly. But again. Uh, balancing it with the need for the right data without burdening uh, companies uh, for, uh, for putting together all the data. Uh, next strategy, next slide please. And then again, I touched on this earlier, but also uh, we would look to provide economic incentives to grow the green economy. As I said, uh, ESD, has already started to use incentives for green economy jobs and, and industries. Um, but, um, and I know you all share this belief, we know that green economy industries are poised for significant growth. And so, you know, anchoring an in-state supply chain for growing uh, green businesses that'll help us to achieve its, uh, our climate, grow, uh, climate goals, but also promote business expansion, uh, expansion and attracting new investments and new green economy jobs. And, you know, we believe that we can leverage the state's climate policies to develop and to, to support the development of an in-state supply chain of green economy companies um, and, uh, and do so by offering the many incentives that we have um, through programs in the state like the Excelsior Tax Credits or NYSTAR or New York Ventures. Next slide, please or last slide. So I'm not gonna read through the, the summary. I'm trying to um, adhere to uh, Chairman Segos' view to be nimble. Uh, suffice it to say that, um, uh, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, these strategies in the aggregate will help to uh, meet uh, the goals of our panel. So uh, with that, let me turn it all back over to the, uh, the Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, good job. Um, let's see for questions, Gavin, I, I see your hand up. Is that from last time? Sorry, that I should take it down. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Gavin. Anyone else? Okay, great work, Eric. Um, thanks Thank for, you, uh, you gave us five minutes and 24 seconds back. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Not that anyone's counting. All I'll right. Report next time. <laughs> Sounds good. Deal. Um, all right, off to the last group, the Just Transition Working Group, uh, Roberta Reed and Doreen Harris. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you again today, although it's still virtual. I want to see faces in front of me one of these days. On behalf of President Harris and myself, I have the pleasure of providing the Climate Action Council with a chair update on the progress of the Just Transition Working Group. And while there is much to be said about our efforts to date, I will keep it brief. Uh, because I want to allow some time for questions and discussion, and besides Basil's told me to, which is really the important part. So, our first slide, uh, much of our scope of work derives directly from the statutory requirements prescribed in our working group. In developing our work plan, we propose that in effort to better stitch together our work streams, we would develop a set of just transition principles. We began our discussions with a list of research-based high-level categories, such as stakeholder engagement, repairing inequities, job creation, and protection of natural systems. Once our group came to consensus on the categories, staff drafted corresponding language. The language was informed again by research and with an eye to wording that is tailored to New York State. Now that we have an understanding for what a just transition in New York should strive to achieve, we will look forward to exploring the application of these principles with our working group and sharing these principles with the advisory panels with the hope that the principles can serve to guide advisory panel recommendations, acknowledging that each principle may have different applicability depending on the economic sector. Next slide, please. 
So the next slide is the power plant inventory and site reuse. And we've heard other uh, reports today about some of this. This slide lays out the status of our work pertaining to the two power plant work streams tasked to the Just Transition Working Group. You may recall that these work products are one, a power plant inventory to identify generation facilities that may be closed as a result of a transition, and two, an identification of issues and opportunities presented by site reuse. To tackle these two work streams, the Just Transition Working Group has formed a power plant subgroup led by Chair John Rhodes, and the subgroup has commenced meeting and is making really good progress on both work streams. Regarding the plant inventory, preliminary data categories have been identified and research efforts underway to collect data and a preliminary list of issues and opportunities presented by site reuse has also been identified with work ahead to build on that list. I would say that the power plant workforce transition issues stand out as a point of emphasis thus far. And a lot of our discussions have been around understanding and managing workforce transition impacts and priorities. As President Harris mentioned at the beginning, NYSERDA recently released a $5 million RFP to provide site reuse planning resources for power plant host communities. The subgroup and full JTWG are considering a similar resource on the power plant workforce side. We've indicated here as an issue to explore how wide to cast the net in completing the plant inventory, which is a topic under discussion by the subgroup and the entire working group. And finally, we've had some great engagement with the power generation advisory panel at our December meeting and discussions are being held later this week to get members of the land use and local government advisory panel looped into the power plant subgroup discussions as well. So this slide is about business impacts, and we've been very busy on this front. We've established quite the partnership with the Energy Intensive and Trade Exposed Industries Advisory Panel through our business impact subgroup. The subgroup has been hard at work diving into the many business-oriented tasks assigned to the Just Transition Working Group. During the Just Transition Working Group's November 17th meeting, we heard an update from the subgroup about their work to date and collectively agreed to an approach for how to identify New York's energy intensive and trade exposed industries, looking at emissions intensity, energy intensity, and trade exposure. Staff are working to collect data to begin that identification process, aiming to have their findings ready by next month for further discussion. In the same November meeting, we also heard a presentation about leakage to establish a uniform understanding from which the subgroup can explore measures that can help to limit leakage. Since this meeting, the subgroup has begun to explore some of the opportunities associated with a carbon neutral economy. Hearing a presentation from NYSERDA about how the state is working to harness the multi multitude of opportunities associated with offshore wind development. This has helped to prepare the subgroup for an initial business opportunities and challenges identification. Next slide. So this is about the job study and the job study is a very big part of what the Just Transition Working Group is working on. The key, one of the key objectives of our group is to execute a study to analyze a broad set of employment impact questions related to reaching the state's carbon neutral economy. And this activity is characterized as the job study. In the past month, agency staff have conducted a mini bid process which resulted in the selection of a contractor to support this study. The contractor has begun working with staff on development of the detailed work plan and schedule. The job study will address topics such as training and workforce opportunities for disadvantaged communities. And if you think about what Eric was talking about in his presentation a few minutes ago, there are lots of workforce development issues that need to be tackled. And I just wanna point out that workforce we're looking at areas, not just in the construction and conveyance of power, but everything that supports it, including people who maintain green energy buildings. So it's a very large area. And then for the final uh, slide, the workforce slide itself. So the final slide presents our workforce development and training work stream. This is closely aligned with the job study as well as cross panel engagement. The scope of this effort will include opportunities and training needs for new, including 
disadvantaged workers and existing workers. And I said a minute ago, these jobs are not the simply in the construction trades and in the flow of energy, but all of the support industries that go into it. So there's really a much larger area for workforce development than people tend to think when they think about this. It will explore the vast network of workforce development options, how to connect workers to the best training and reskilling for them. So there will be training for people who are not currently employed in these areas, and there will be reskilling for people who are being moved from fossil fuel jobs into the green sector. It will also include an assessment of workforce development for trades, for disadvantaged communities and underrepresented segments of the population, and very importantly, transitioning power plant workers, as I said, from fossil fuels into the green area. Green area. Um, I think that was the fastest presentation of all four, don't you, Basil? <laughs> I think so. I think so. You did a good job. Are there any questions for me? Let's see. Raya. Uh, hello. I just I wanted to say thank you and to the previous uh, presenter. This is really, in my mind, an area where New York State is leading, where it's challenging and abstract, yet so critical and important. And so I um, heard a lot of encouraging um, uh, focus on um, op you know open mindedness, mindedness, creativity, an important focus on data, a focus on COVID, and how this can help be a part of our. Um, and I wanted to ask, and this is something other panels can focus on too, is it? But it seems like here there could be a real role for regulation, and I'm wondering if for if this panel and the one prior have thought about um, thinking about. Uh, reg, you know, recommendations for regulations and codes, et cetera, in particular. So, uh, do you mean regulations and codes for the training opportunities, like the the standards to be met and that kind of thing? Because that's certainly something we could we should look into. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I also, to, to be fair, I was also thinking about your previous <laughs> your previous presenter. Uh, um, in in um, energy intensive industries, but but yes, I think in procurement and standardization, um, um, that that could certainly be an issue here as well. So in the uh, registered apprenticeship programs that we oversee in the state, and a lot of them are in the building and construction trades, but there are also others outside their manufacturing, healthcare. The reg the uh, regulations are very strict on how you have a registered apprenticeship. You have to have a certain amount of hours of training that's overseen, the curriculum is overseen by SED. So it is a pretty regulated thing already. And it is a great tool to use in this area where we're transitioning into a new area of work and a new area of training. So I, you're right, there's, there's a, uh, it's a great opportunity to make sure that we're meeting the right standards. Well, thank you so much for that. Okay, any other questions? Fantastic. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, please. We're getting near the end, folks. Uh, just a few updates on the uh, Climate Justice Working Group. Next slide. Thank you. Um, as you all know, the, this work is continuing. Um, they have some meetings set for tomorrow um, on target for a uh, goal of having draft criteria by March and um, and right now really developing a list of the criteria. Thank you, Rosa, for your work in, in shepherding this through. Um, working to finalize an evaluation rubric to narrow down this list uh, to those that, uh, that best identify the goal of, of identifying disadvantaged communities. And um, in addition to the energy uh, intensive, they've had early engagement with the transportation, land use, and government panel. So um that that group is moving along nicely um i think it, at some point we're going to want to have them back and have them uh brief out on on what they're doing but uh, it's been good progress thus far um any questions for either me or rosa or anyone else about the just the uh climate justice work okay great um next slide please so this is the next step slides. We are at the end. Um, the next 
CAC meeting that we have booked is January 19th. So please put that in your calendars. We'll try to get you the agendas uh, early. Um, and I assume we will be doing it by Zoom uh, because while we are looking at a light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps with uh, the vaccine, we're necessarily gonna be in a, in a protective mode by that point. So let's plan on doing this by Zoom. Uh, any other questions for the good of the order? Any comments before we move on? Uh, Paul, you have something? Yeah, I, I don't know if you'll allow me to ask a crazy question. Of uh, course, Paul. Come on. Um, so, uh, January will be at, at uh, past the halfway mark towards uh, the two-year milestone of, of producing a, a draft scoping plan. I'm just wondering, is it possible to get a summary of where we are in, in the process of producing that plan and the timeline? Uh, I feel unsure about that process. And so I'm wondering if the committee members will benefit, if there's a way to summarize how we get from here to there. Can you take that, Jared? Sure. Um, Paul, why don't we have Jared weigh in on that, Jared? Do some thoughts? Uh, sure, Paul. So, I, you know, I think we're on track. Um, the, the advisory panels are working on having their um, recommendations by um, early spring. So, you know, around the end of March, um, early April. And, and then that will feed into um an integration process because obviously there's going to be overlap um between a number of these recommendations um and and so then you know think about um you know most of the rest of the year then will be after that point will be the council's deliberation over those recommendations from the panels you know how they fit together um you know which ones the, the the council you know really wants to prioritize in producing a draft plan by the end of next year, which is the the statutory requirement, and then we take public comment on that, and uh, the final plan has to be uh, produced by the council at the end of 2022, and you know staff will be available to help. Uh, the council, the E3 consulting group as well um, in the analytical work um, in, in preparing um, that scoping plan. So the E3 group will have a, a primary role in producing the draft document, is that right? Yeah, I think. I think, oh. Go ahead, Sorry, Doreen. Jared. I was, I was, yeah, I was just going to jump in. E3's role is primarily analytic. You know, they they will be essentially updating their work um, in integrating what you know to, to Jared's point the the information that comes from the panels. So at this moment, Paul, we don't have um, you know we're we're waiting for the panels to do their work in order to accomplish that analytic step. However. Um, you are correct in saying that the scoping plan is not going to be drafted by the by the um, E3 group, which is where I, I'm guessing uh, Jared was headed. Right. I mean, staff staff will be available to um, assist the council. I mean, we, we expect the staff for the various agencies at the direction of the council will do most of uh, the drafting of the scoping plan, but it's it's. Now, I want to emphasize it's at the direction of the council. You know, the council determines the direction and, you know, think of staff as being, you know, the, 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 the group that will, will, you know, put sort of your, your ideas to the page. My CERTA and DEC staff, that's what you mean and, by staff. Well, and, and, and the other agencies that are involved in this as well. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. Thanks for indulging me the question. Thanks. Um, we have Rose now. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, my my comment goes a little bit to a question that Anne had early on with with transportation. So 
as we cross reference and go forward, will we have some kind of economic analysis of generally ballpark what costs are? Because you know, plans are great because they if they they're not tied to to costs, then we can dream. But we need to tie it to costs. So do do we have anybody that's coming in to I, I get it, it's all ballpark, but any kind of economic analysis. Doran, you want to get that? Oh yeah, sorry, I just dropped my phone. Um Yes, I mean, of course, our, our frame of reference is going to be the goals of the CLCPA, right? Um, in that we're, we're setting forth the achievement of the goal that is in law, such that, you know, cost is looked at from the perspective of relative costs, you know, of potential solutions, as I think about it. Um, given that we'll have, you know, I would imagine various pathways that we would be considering relative costs, I think, would be, would be part of that consideration. But I do want, you know, I know that for all of us, our, our overall goal is to obviously achieve what is set forth in the act. So I, I think from my perspective, cost does have um, a different lens through which um, we'll be thinking about those issues. Um, and also, you know, I think it is true um, that where we sit today, and, and I know Chair Rhodes spoke to this in his panel um, presentation, that, that in part, we also have to look at where we will be on costs in the long term, um, not just in the near term. Um, things, goals like ours are cost reduction drivers. So we'll also not, look, not only look at just costs of today, but the costs obviously moving forward um, from a trajectory perspective. Okay. Yeah. I, Go ahead. I, it, it's just that, um, it, it, I, I mean, there are just certain ideas that are great ideas, and I get it. First of all, anything that's market based, who knows? The market will drive it. Um, but there are just certain certain uh, ideas that you know we do have a frame of reference, and it would just be great to give a sense of a frame of reference because if the idea is bigger than the budget. The entire budget of New York State, as there have you know been recommendations to that, we know it's not going to work. So I just encourage getting somebody to also just get give a frame of reference of what we're we're looking at and the future. You know, as technology gets more and more advanced and used, it will be. You know, we don't have to go into. A, uh, detailed projection, but just some sense would would be great. Yep, totally agree. And this is part of the E3 scope, Rose. Just just to be crystal clear, um, they're going to look at a not only resource costs as a whole, but also cost benefit analyses as well. Um, to your point, obviously, <laughs> we we need to look at the overall scale, but. But also, I think the benefits that would come from the investments, um, such as health benefits, too. Right, right. But yes, this exactly. is very much part of our scope. Good, good. Okay, thanks, Rose. <clears throat> we have Anne and then Peter. Hi. Um, so, my question is following up on a couple other questions. Um, when I asked which of the subgroups on transportation would be examining TCI, it, it seemed like, uh, well, I, I wasn't sure what the answer was of which subgroup it would be. And it seemed like it was more like uh, there's consideration that might be a question more for the council. And similarly, when Gavin asked about carbon pricing, the answer was that the panel has talked about how that might be a question more for the panel, which is cool with me, but I'm just wondering what what that means in terms of the criteria is it is there some type of questions to that the council is going to be tackling whether or not a policy should be recommended and if so when do we start to do that marie trace do you want to handle the question as to what subgroup is handling this So we're um, 
we're definitely taking uh, a good look at both issues uh, underneath the uh, transportation advisory panel. Um, obviously, low carbon uh, fuel standards and other things have come up uh, as recently as our, our roundtable discussions this last week. Um, and it's been a, a robust engagement. So we'll be looking at that directly in the transportation uh, panel. I assume that other panels will also be looking at it. It's not a sole issue. Um, <clears throat> and then as we look at TCI, I think it's one of many things that are on the table with regard to how we how we actually look uh, at and approach um, the larger issue. TCI, as I said before, is more of a regional issue. And the question more uh, as we take on the CLCPA implementation as part of the CAC is how do we look at this from, um, you know, the many things that are on the table with regard to New York's approach. So uh, I do think it is more of a, it is one of the many things that is out there that we need to look at. So my question actually was which of the four subgroups are going to be looking at TCI or discussing TCI? Of your four transportation subgroups, it's not a, it's not a specific subgroup. It's not a specific subgroup per se. It's the it's the entirety of the transportation advisory panel. So, if somebody else wants to take that on, they're welcome to. Jared, if you want to weigh in. But. And there, there, there is a. Um, a, a group of, of members of the uh, um, advisory panel that have been working um, these types of issues, um, much conversation about financing strategies as well, how to um, you know, use tools like the group to support some of the other strategies. You know, as, as Commissioner Dominguez, you know, mentioned that that work really, you know, cuts across the, the four um, categories that were um, discussed in the, the slides you saw earlier. Okay. We have a weird delay on our system for some reason. Um, okay, more to come on that for sure. Um, let's see. I think we had Peter and then Gavin and Rye. I don't know if your your hand is still up from last time. Yeah, thanks, Basil. I appreciate it. Um, sure. So, just on on uh, one a quick question, and then I have a couple of comments based on that last Q and A. Uh, the the question I have is. There was a, a job posting or a couple job postings. Um, you guys still recruiting for an executive director and other staff for the Climate Action Council, or did I miss some announcement there? We uh, we are um, well. We we had uh, recruited for um, a couple of positions to support the Climate Action Council, and hope to have an announcement uh, sooner than later. Um, but at this moment. Um, we were, we're working through a short list of candidates. Um, okay. We certainly Thanks. would, I think, all benefit uh, as we head toward the springtime and having that sort of central central role um, to lean on, particularly as the advisory, advisory panels report out. And that question was not not meant to be a reflection of the, the wonderful tutelage that you <laughs> and the co-chair are providing <laughs> for this, as well as the staff backup. And I didn't say at the beginning because I didn't want to chew up time, but I will now. Since we have a little bit of time, but um, I think the notes for these meetings are just uh, really pretty amazing. Uh, the minutes that are kept. So whoever on staff is doing those, kudos to the staff there because they really are reflective of the, the conversation in enough detail uh, without being exhaustive. So um, just a quick props to whoever is uh, taking and refining those notes because they're they're spot on and great for the minutes. So thanks. Um, yeah. Um, on, on the staffing. So one one thing I just wanted to sort of weigh in on, when it strikes me um, on issues like TCI and um, you know carbon pricing within the electricity sectors, these are things that get into integration. Um, and Jared talked about the integration of these issues coming out of the panels in March. 
I don't know. It seems like with TCI, with a lot of the concerns of many members that make up the climate justice working group, um, because it is a, a pricing scheme, um, if you will, and uh, there's a lot of consternation around that in terms of its equity and justice frame. Many already, many groups weighing in with the governor several, actually more than a year and a half ago. Strikes me as that probably is one of these things that shouldn't be deliberated at a panel because it is going to integrate a lot of what the CAC is doing and it would be probably best to have a discussion about that at the council level and, and, and have it at this table rather than at sub tables. And I would probably share that same opinion for carbon pricing in the electricity sector. There's different ways to go about doing it. Um, and I think the sooner we have that at this table, whether it's within the confines of the ISO market structure or Another concept out there could be DEC actually setting a, an emissions um, uh, price on carbon pollution from power plants on top of what is you know already uh, uh, obtained through the red auction process is just a different way to do it. So, I mean, I think the faster we get these things surfaced out of the panels and into the healthy discussion of the, the council where they're ultimately going to end up, probably the better. And P Peter, thank you for raising, <coughs> raising that about. TCI, excuse me. I mean, certainly one of the things, if I take your your comment as a suggestion about bringing it in front of the in front of the panel for presentation, that's something we could take under advisement. And um, as we shape the the next agenda, uh, we'll reach out to you guys on that. Thanks, I appreciate that. Yep. Okay, Gavin, and then I see. I see Raya having uh, raised the question again. Okay, um, <clears throat> a couple questions for Jared. Um, the first one is on the social cost of carbon. We we talked last council meeting. Uh, my organization put in comments on the guidance document. I know many others have. Under the law, uh, it's supposed to be finalized by January first. Can Jared give us an update on where that social cost of carbon is at this point? Sure, Gavin, we, um, we've considered a, a number of comments um, that came in um, and, uh, you know, fairly, fairly good um, cross section of comments from various um, interests. We're um, really in the final stages of evaluating those comments and determining, you know, what changes, if any, should be made in the guidance um, before we issue it in final. So I think we're getting pretty close on that. And we are conscious that um, there is a deadline in the statute of having that done by the end of the year. Um, and then my thanks, Jerry, for that. My last point is something that my friend Rose Harvey mentioned, uh, the importance of cost studies. Uh, I think the sooner the better, the more in depth, the better. The real live, you know, costs as of today and what the future looks like are critically important to making these decisions and are Really going to be a benchmark for me uh, in making some recommendations of the scoping plan. So I just reiterate uh, Rose's point. Uh, I think a number of us are concerned about the cost side of this. Thanks, Gavin. So noted. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Raya and then Donna. Thank you so much. I just uh, thanks to everyone for just a really jam packed set informative meeting. And 1 of the things that just, there were so, you know, something that so many of the panels and the co chairs are focused on is the development of um, great data. Um, there's so many investigations happening, be it as the social cost of carbon was mentioned. We've got cost analysis and a lot of other um, data on emissions to Spanish community, et cetera. I'm. Uh, looking at our timetable, I'm personally I'm very excited about um, digging into that data, and uh, and and uh, I'm wondering sort of what are what do folks have teed up in terms of really kind of getting their arms around it, and how are there some ways that we can make sure that we take advantage of you know the expert and academic community, some of which is on our panels, some of you know which are anxious to contribute to sort of buttress um, the data that's being presented, um, and, you know, and just sort of it also create, you know, alternative scenarios and analysis that could be really helpful. You know, I know there are a lot of folks who want to weigh in 
Um, and so that's my my question. Is I guess one, how are we teeing up analysis so that this body can digest it in a cognizant way um, soon? And how can we enable additional expert analysis on our panels and also um, on this body? Thanks, Raya. I, I think um, I, I'd be interested to know specifically what the panel chairs might say to that uh, to that question. Is there anyone who would want to jump in in that respect? I mean, I'm happy to speak to it generally and certainly from the perspective of the Just Transition Working Group, but I don't know if um, perhaps for instance, John Rhodes might want to jump in if, if he's able. Am I unmuted? Okay. Yes. So, yeah, you're unmuted. Um, yep. Okay. So, um, uh, as we will, obviously we need to have, you know, supporting, um, numerology analysis data to um, to come up with the recommendations. Um, right now, uh, that's all still in process. Um, and uh, we've got, you know, a lot of resources to help. E3, a lot of um, existing work that's been done along the way, uh, but we're actually in the process of sorting out where it is that we might need to do some just for this purpose, numerology. Uh, and I guarantee you we'll share whatever we have um, with this council as soon as we have it. Um, so uh, I agree with the spirit behind the question, like, uh, you know, some of the stuff has to be based on numbers. Um, and, uh, and obviously so do Gavin and Rose. Um, so do we all. Uh, but that's frankly still work in process. All right, I can see you. You seem to be speaking, but I can't hear you. Or are you maybe on mute? Dear, of course I was. Um, oh. Do you think there will be opportunities for further, you know, input from, you know, our friends, uh, allies, um, folks in the, you know, academic and study community? And also potential, you know, I will definitely say that uh, I, I would be thrilled, to, you know, if there's any way to any interest in what additional info may be needed, or I, it would be great this bot, for this body to at some point just figure out how to get our arms around, you know, what's coming and how we can potentially make recommendations on that. Um, in addition to just, I just, I know there are a lot of experts who would love to contribute and I'm wondering if there are more ways for that to happen. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I am, I am thinking that, you know, to the extent that there is expertise to bring to bear on the panels themselves, right? I, I, my, my personal view would be that that should be happening over the next few months, but on a panel by panel, um, in a panel by panel manner, for sure. Um, clearly, uh, I would say that when, when this comes to us as a council in the you know, March, April timeframe, that's when our chance uh, comes together, right? To really dig into, into those recommendations and then ultimately in the integration analysis that we've referred to as to how the pieces are put together, which admittedly, I expect to bring, you know, new information to bear that, you know, we're gonna have to figure out what to do with it. Um, to your point, this, this work from E3 is going to need, um, you know, some, some, in some cases, significant updates. So I think for you and the council members, that time frame is sort of in the springtime, but I do think the panel, the panel engagement should be sooner than later. You know, a, a great example was that deep decarbonization workshop. Um, I, I, I literally can't tell you how much, um, how, how, the, how positive the feedback has been, but these are experts, right? They're experts on particular areas. Um, uh, of technology that that I do think uh, the panels really should should bring forth as they prepare the next few months. No, oh, thank you very much. And and obviously, Raya, suffice it to say, if there's anyone that you would 
would recommend, um, please, please bring it forth. Uh, we're, we're super, we're very open to that um, suggestion. No, thank you. Okay, Donna. Try to be brief, thank you. First, thank you for that deep decarbonization workshop. I, I really thought that was excellent. Um, I couldn't see all of it, but it was very, very useful. And, and, and hearing from those experts is really, really helpful, I think. And the reason my hand was really up was the same comment that Rose made earlier, um, endorsing this, this um, plan to do the uh, cost analysis. I think it's critically important and then to endorse what Gavin said, I think the sooner the better, um, really on two fronts. One is, as Doreen said, to help prioritize these pathways. I, I find it um, hard for me to still think about how do, how do we get to that work? Um, and how do we decide, given we probably don't have unlimited budgets? And then the second reason is um, this concept of minimizing leakage that, that was covered by Eric and um, Roberta in their reports. Um, we hear from our industrial customers that they're very um, interested in how to decarbonize, but they don't understand what's going to be required and what the cost might be. So I think all this work is really important. So thank you. I, I'm glad we're doing this. Thank you, Donna. Um, <clears throat> Peter, your hand is still up. Do you have a question? Okay. Mariah, you're good, right? Great. Okay. I think that's everyone then. Um, great meeting. Lots of good Q&A. Again, next meeting on January 19th. We'll see you then. Be safe and have a wonderful holiday, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Be well and be safe. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair you. and Madam Chair. Thank you.